It's a bright, sunshiny afternoon here on the shores of the San Francisco Bay. And what a surprise, it's a little bit windy. The Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week, the Giants and the Reds. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller. Welcome to our telecast. Indeed, it is Cinco de Mayo, and they're celebrating it here at Candlestick all through the weekend. And this is the, the final part of the weekend. Unfortunately for the Giants, it's been the Reds who've been celebrating. They came in here with a nine-game losing streak, but now they've won the first two. Meanwhile, Barry Bonds, he is on fire. It's been the Barry Bonds show all week long. Last Saturday, this was home run number 300. Later in the same game, he hit another one. Then on Tuesday, in San Diego, he hit a grand slam home run in San Diego and, for good measure, hit another two-run homer later in that game. The next night, he homered again against Fernando Valenzuela and still on fire both ways. He robbed Ken Caminiti of a home run. During the week, in six games, he's hit 440, Joe, with six homers and 15 runs battered in. Barry Bonds, he is something else. Well, I was getting excited just watching the film clip. But John Smiley's going to be the guy that has to try to stop Barry Bonds today. And I don't think Smiley's really equipped to bother Bonds very much. In fact, Bonds is two for seven with two home runs off of Smiley. But Matt Williams is 15 for 32 with seven home runs. And I think Bonds and, and Williams must have switched bodies over the winter because now Bonds is the home run hitter, the slugger, and Matt Williams is the average hitter, hitting 355. Indeed, and it's quite a duo, a quite a great one-two combination. Now for the Reds, Barry Larkin missed the ball game yesterday. He had some uh, spasms in his back in the left shoulder area. It's still a little tight, he says, but he's in there. And, of course, uh, Eric Davis also back with the Reds and playing well. Well, I think he's been the most pleasant surprise for the Reds this season. And yesterday he hit a grand slam to help them, as you mentioned, break their nine-game losing streak the day before. Now they've won two in a row. But the real thing is that Eric Davis has done all the little things for the Reds. He's bunted. He's stolen a base. He's get sacrificed. He's given himself up. But most of all, he's been the center fielder on this ball club. And we know how great a center fielder he was in his heyday. And he always hits well here at Candlestick. He's hitting fifth in the order today. The Giants and the Reds, Van Landing, Hammond, Smiley will be back. The Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week, and we're ready to play ball here in San Francisco. Ray Knight, first-year manager of the Reds. He had been the manager in waiting under previous manager, Davey Johnson. And uh, it's been a struggle, to say the least. They just ended a nine-game losing streak. Rookie Eric Owens in left. Hal Morris, the veteran at first. Barry, Lincoln, uh, Barry Larkin back in the lineup, but short. Eric Anthony hits cleanup in right. Eric Davis in center field, hitting fifth. Willie Green at third base. Brett Moon hitting seventh at second base. Joe Oliver back for the Reds. He's the catcher. John Smiley hits ninth. He's the starting pitcher. And for the Giants, William Van Landingham. And he's been somewhat of an enigmatic figure for the Giants. He just has not done that well. They thought he would. Well, they thought he was going to be their top starter at the beginning of the season. But he did pitch very, very well. In fact, his last outing was his best of the season. He is capable of pitching a good ball game, good fastball, and runs in on the right-handers. So here is Eric Owens. First ball swinging into shallow center. Aurelia, the shortstop, and he takes it right in front of Stan Javier. So we've got a, a very aggressive start by the Reds. But that was a good example right there. Fastball ran right in on his hands. And when you look at the Giants, you have to think of Barry Bonds and Matt Williams, two great defensive players as well as power hitters. But they've got Robbie Thompson back, and Thompson has won a gold glove also. So they have a very good defensive infield, and especially when you get Sean Dunstan back in there. Now Hal Morris, the veteran left-handed hitter. Morris comes on hitting 312. And of course, that's just about an average Morris average. 312. One ball to no strikes. It's a windy afternoon here at uh, Candlestick Park, as you might expect. John, that we, fastball is too high. We both grew up here, so <laughs> we're used to that. <laughs> it's just a, the, the thing is when you get the wind and then the fog rolls in, and sometimes there's wind and then there's wind. Or as they call it here, there's the hawk that comes in from the Pacific. That's a called strike, and it is two and one to Hal Morris. But it's beautiful right now, a beautiful setting for the ball game. As the Giants and Reds have at it. Barry Larkin is on deck. There's the view from out in that left field. Shallow left. Barry Bonds can't handle it. Morris will dig for second. The center fielder Javier over to pick it up. Did I say he was a great left fielder? 
Actually, it looked like he might have lost that ball in the sun behind us here, but Barry Bonds normally makes that play. Hal Morris hits this ball off the end of the bat. Barry charges. He gets there, but you can see him looking down right there, but he doesn't have sunglasses on. It hits off the top of his glove. Very unusual for Barry, who most people think is the best left fielder in baseball, but he doesn't come up with that one. And I guess they're waiting to decide whether it's a hit or not. Should be an error. And they have now ruled error on the left fielder, Barry Bonds. Here's Barry Larkin, last year's MVP in the National League. Barry, again, had some uh, back spasms in the upper back near the left shoulder that kept him out of the lineup yesterday. And he says it's still a little bit stiff, but he's back in there tonight because he's afraid of losing his job. <laughs> <laughs> on the right field line. And that will go back in amongst the spectators down there. When he said that, near the batting cage, the hitting instructor, Hal McCray, said, OK, afraid of losing your job. Which job? <laughs> you got about nine of them. And of course, you see Larkin's numbers last year, National League MVP. He's the red shortstop. He's the leader on that infield. He's the leader in the clubhouse. He is, in fact, by title, the captain of this ball club. Barry Larkin, indeed, has a lot of jobs on this Cincinnati team. One ball and two strikes. And there you see Van Landingham at his best when he gets the ball down and it sinks to the right hander. As long as he stays down, you know, he should be successful. But he's had a problem this year getting the ball up. And the Giants have given up more home runs than any team in baseball. So, I mean, they're, you know, they're struggling in that capacity. Keeping the ball in the ballpark yesterday, the Reds hit four home runs here. The Giants took a five to three lead into the seventh inning. And that's when Eric Davis hit his grand slam to put the Reds ahead. And they went on to win the ball game nine to seven. The Giants also hit four home runs. The Giants, in addition to giving up the most, lead the National League in hitting home runs. And they say the ball has just been flying out of this ballpark this year. It's become a great home run ballpark. Two and two the count. It's only 365 out into left center. And they have a 365 marker in right center. But Joe, I think the actual right center, the power alley under, right. look where that marker is out by that gap sign. The marker would ordinarily be well to the right of that gap sign. That's almost straightaway center field. Yeah, and it's only 365 out there. So this is a real home run hitter's paradise now. They moved in those fences out there in right field to put a little bleacher section in out there. Now Van Landingham steps off the slab. Two balls, two strikes to Barry Larkin. I would bet it's only maybe 350, if that, to the actual power alley in right center. Joe gets real excited when he starts thinking about how shallow it is. Well, you know, he takes his mic off and he says, uh, somebody give me a bat, quick. <laughs> I talked to Bobby Bonds, who was a coach, and Jimmy Davenport, both coaches for the Giants, and they said they've never seen the ball fly out of there, out of here like it has been, you know, this season. And, uh, you know, it could be the poor pitching, as people want to say it is, and uh, the fact that these players are bigger and stronger, and some of the ballparks are smaller. Two and two, the count to Barry Larkin. Morris hit second, one out here in the first. This one is into play, but into that short power alley, way back. Oh, it's gone, a home run. He got jammed and hit a high fly ball. And I tell you, that's got to be the shortest right center field power rally in Major League Baseball. Exactly what they were talking about yesterday. There were several balls hit yesterday that did not appear to be hit that well, but they went well out of the ballpark. In fact, Barry Bonds hit one. He said jammed him a little bit, and he hit it out. So this is a small ballpark. And you'll take a look at this fastball. It's out over the plate. Barry's going the other way, as he does a lot of times. And the ball just continues to carry. Stan Javier and Glenn Allen Hill just can't run out of room there in right center field. There's two runs up on the board. And the Giants can't keep the ball in the ballpark. Here is Eric Anthony, a left-handed hitter. And sinker is low ball one. Anthony, in 40 at-bats, has hit four home runs with six RBIs. He has a 275 average. So the Reds have jumped ahead again. One is hit high in the air, fairly deep out there, but playable for Javier. He makes the catch. You see that 365 marker just to the left of the screen there. There it is. I mean, that is just to the right of straightaway. 
center field. And the 400 mark that normally you would think was in center field is really to the left of center field. So very unique dimensions here in this ballpark. Well, right now, the flags up on the roof of the stadium indicate that the wind is blowing out. And it looked to me like the wind gave Larkin's ball a push. Right. Well, in that gap there, right, almost straight away right field, it does get some help. But as you mentioned, the ball that was hit to center field, Anthony may have hit his just as well, but it was in a different area, and he did not get any wind help. Eric Davis, the hitter. And the count is one ball and one strike. Now, Davis does not have a very good batting average. It's only 215. He does have five homers, and he has 18 runs batted in. He leads the club in that category. And the count is one ball and two strikes. Davis said after spending a year away from the game, he's got a whole new attitude about baseball. As he's uh, got a better perspective on the game. The curveball is in there. Strike three call. Well, for now, Davis is a strikeout victim. The Reds get two. Bonds will be coming up third when we get back. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from Candlestick Park. John Miller, Joe Morgan with you. And the Reds are out front of Dusty Baker's Giants. Of course, the Giants have hit more home runs than any National League team this year. And they've averaged five and a half runs per game. So Dusty knows that they're well capable of uh, getting back in this one in a hurry. For the Giants, Stan Javier, formerly with Oakland, who will lead it off in center field. Robbie Thompson, he seems to be healthy again, and he's hitting the ball well. Barry Bonds, look at that. 446 homers, 15 batted in in six games. Matt Williams at third base, also a, a great early start. Mark Carrion, he's developed into an outstanding hitter here, playing every day. Glenn Allen Hill, big home run and RBI man. Rich Aurelia up for the injured Sean Dunstan. Tom Lampkin, the catcher for the injur uh, injured Kurt uh, Manwaring. And Van Landingham is the pitcher. For the Reds, a veteran left-hander. John Smiley on the hill, and they need to get him going. He's off to a terrible start. Javier leads it off, a switch at a batting right-handed. You can see the jugs gun ready. Strike one. Well, there you see Smiley. Good fastball, big slow curveball, and a changeup. But he's been getting in trouble one inning out of the ball game, he's been giving up a lot of extra base hits and giving up a lot of runs in one inning. He usually has one four inning during the ball game. That's what has really hurt him. Smiley again has had some big winning seasons as a big leaguer. They're counting on him to go and win 15 or 16 ball games this year. So they badly need him to get it together here. And the Reds uh, feel that even though they've had such a terrible start, a combination of some injuries to key people like Reggie Sanders, a guy they can ill afford to lose. Home run man, fine outfielder, speed. He's the whole package, and, and they need him badly. He's out. And of course, Smiley's in there, but he's been terrible. A ball by Javier. One ball and two strikes. Also, Pete Shortick, who had such a breakthrough season last year. Pete Shortick is 3-1, and one, but has not pitched that well either. A high ERA above five. And Mark Portugal, a veteran, the former Giants, has not won a game yet. And the count goes to two and two. He does have a lead with which to work as we get underway here today. And in talking to Dusty Baker before the ball game, they got Van Landingham a lead last time, and he pitched his best ball game of the season. So he was hoping to be able to get him a couple of runs early today. That's not going to happen. Broken bat up the middle. Brett Boone, he thought about dishing it off to Larkin, but there was no play to be had. Base hit, Javier has excellent speed. Well, I think one of the reasons Boone didn't throw is he had surgery on his elbow after spring training, and he's not all the way back. But they do have a very good defensive infield. When you look at Larkin, who won the Gold Glove last year, and Brett Boone, who could have won because, I mean, he played excellent defense last year. They do have a very good defensive ball club, the Reds. Robbie Thompson. So Robbie has been through uh, baseball hell the last three years. Injury problems. The batting average just went south. And a lot of people around baseball thought he was finished. Yes. But then this winter, he healed up, and so far this year, he's hit the ball well. He's hitting 281, three home runs early on, and he's still one of the outstanding second basemen around. 
a foul out of play. The question will be, is he going to stay healthy through the year for the Giants? Well, and he's already had some injuries. He's missed a few ball games this year. That is part of his problem. When he has played, he has played well. And Robbie Thompson's a guy that has some power. He takes the high fastballs. You throw him a few high fastballs, and he hits home runs for you. But he's a good player. He's a good, smart player, and a very good defensive second baseman. Good live fastball there by Smiley. 89 miles an hour on the Jugs gun. One ball and two strikes. Barry Bonds is on deck for the Giants. There's Barry making his practice cuts. So far, we've seen Smiley at his best, hitting the outside corner with the fastball and then back inside. And this will probably be a changeup. Yeah. And he uh, he's throwing the ball pretty well, but again, he has made mistakes during the middle of the ball game that have really hurt him. Wingo Kim, the third base coach, flashing some signs to Thompson. Two and two the count. Nobody out. Javier over at first base after an infield single. And Smiley sends it back to the bag. Morris on the bag there with him. Javier with, was with Oakland. He's a pretty handy player, switch hitter. Hits fairly well. He, he can steal a lot of bases for you. And is a very fine outfielder. The throw from Oliver in the dirt. Javier had a good jump, and Oliver tried to rush. It wasn't a good ball to throw on. You see, he gets a good jump, but the pitch is down. And Oliver comes up, tries to get rid of it quickly, bounces it to second base. Nice play there by Boone to keep it from going into the outfield. Nice play there. Good shot. Second base. Javier safe. That was his first steal of the year for the Giants. He had 36 steals for the Athletics last year. And there's ball four to Robbie Thompson. So here comes Bobby ba or Barry Bonds, Bobby's son. Yeah. Bobby, the giant sitting instructor. And here's what happened yesterday. That ball was actually inside. He got jammed on it. I talked to him before the game, and he said, that ball jammed me a little bit, and I still hit it out of the ballpark. So he told me himself before the ball game that the ball is really flying here. Barry Bonds. Now, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle today who claimed that he is not even in a hot streak right now. He's not in, in the zone where everything seems to be going well at the same time, which is rather incredible since he's, he's had a great week. And there's a base hit to center field. Here comes Javier rounding third. He's going to score. Davis will keep Thompson at second. The ball gets away from Larkin at shortstop. He has to go chase it down the line. Barry Bonds, just like that. Picks up his 36th RBI of the year. He leads the major leagues. John Smiley will try to throw the fastball in tight on Barry Bonds and throw the slow curves and changeups away. Let's take a look and see where this pitch is. He does not get it inside. See, that pitch is out over the plate a little bit. Barry just lines it right back through the middle of the diamond for a base hit. I expect that you'll see for the rest of the evening all the fastballs he throws bonds will be off the plate inside or on the inside corner. He will not make that mistake again. Although it's, maybe it's not a mistake because he kept bonds in the ballpark. Well, now here's Matt Williams, and he is Smiley's worst nightmare. That's a strike. 32 career at bats against Smiley. Not only has Matt Williams, look at that, had 15 hits, but he's had seven home runs against him. I mean, that's an incredible figure against a very fine pitcher. He's already in some big trouble. Two men on, nobody out. And he quickly gets ahead of him. It's 0-2. Matt Williams, as you pointed out, it's right now Barry Bonds hitting all of the homers, and Matt Williams is hitting for average, 355. But he has matured as a hitter, John, and now he hits a lot of line drives back through the middle, balls to right center field. He has just become a good hitter, but I think as the summer goes along, he'll hit the ball out of the ballpark more. singles, which again is yeah. unusual. That kind of reminds you of the numbers Mike Piazza's been putting up yeah. for the Dodgers. Power has not been there yet. There is Robbie Thompson at second base. Barry Bonds at first base. Two to one, the Reds lead. Nobody out. And that's down and in. Now, Ray Knight did tell us, Joe, 
that one of the problems that Smiley's had, and you mentioned he seems to have one bad inning every yeah. game, he says there's something that happens in an inning, and he seems to lose his concentration as if he gets flustered. Sometimes there's an error behind him, or there's a, a walk that he didn't make a good pitch, and he can't seem to get focused after that. And then everything falls apart before he's able to get it back together. It might be happening right here. Well, he could have been upset, John, because he made excellent pitches to Stan Javier, and he finally jammed him, and he hit that little roller back through the middle for a base hit, so he made good pitches, and he didn't get the results he wanted, so that could have been a problem, and then he compounded it by walking Robbie Thompson. So we'll see if Smiley is uh, writing that same old story here in the first inning. The runners go. He struck him out. The throw third. It's a double play. See, they got caught in the new Matt Williams syndrome. In the past, they would have never sent the runners with two strikes on Matt Williams because he would strike out a lot. Now, because he puts the ball in play and he doesn't try to pull everything, you say, well, we can send the runners. But this is an excellent pitch by Smiley, as you see Dusty Baker is upset. But this is a changeup. This is not a 3-2 fastball. And Matt's out in front. Strike him out, throw him out. Good play there by John Smiley to throw the changeup, something that they were not looking for. Willie Green just got down real low to make sure he was able to get the tag on. A nice low tag to double up Robbie Thompson. Batter Mark Carrion with Bonds at second. Bonds, of course, does not get credit for a stolen base. Since the front man got thrown out. And that's in there for a called strike. Another off-speed delivery. Mark Carrion. This guy had been kind of... Uh, put into the role of being a, a pinch hitter and a, and a role player and here in San Francisco he's gotten the chance to play every day and he's become quite a productive hitter. 293, seven homes, 21 batted in. And he hit 300 last year, John. He is, as you mentioned, he was considered a pinch hitter before but he hit so well in spot duty and pinch hitting that they decided to give him a chance and last year, second half of the season, he played almost every day and he hit 300 along the way. Two balls and a strike to carry on. A run is in for the Giants. The Reds lead two to one. I'm sure for Ray Knight and John Smiley, it looked like the same old story. Something went wrong. The Giants had a big inning. Cooking, it looked like. But then he strikes out Matt Williams. With the runners going, and it turns into a double play. Now, he's just one out away from getting out of the inning entirely. But the Giants have a little more power than just Bonds and Williams. As uh, Matt Williams ruminates about that strikeout back on the bench. Now you've got carry on and behind him, Glenn Allen Hill. That one is looped into left and Barry Larkin can't get it. Here comes Bonds to tie it up. Well, the double play does not hurt them because carry on comes through with a base hit to tie the ball game, but they did have a big inning in the making, and but they're glad that I'm sure they're just happy to be able to tie this ball game up. He gets jammed. Another good pitch by Smiley. You see Larkin chases it and just barely misses it, and that cost the Reds a run. But another good pitch. He jammed. He's jammed two hitters, and both of them have gotten singles. Now here is Glenn Allen Hill. Broken bat looper over the middle, but there is Booth. The inning. So the Giants get two, and the game is tied at two as we head to the second from San Francisco. Three home runs, and he takes a strike from Ben Landingham. Two to two. One eventful inning. Up the first base side, carry on, and he'll make the play unassisted. And there is one away. In that first inning, Joe, we saw Barry Bonds make a very uncharacteristic error. And with that bright sunshine out there, here's the play itself. Well, it's reflecting, as you said, off the white shirts that he's looking into right here. Bonds comes in and hits off the top of his glove. And again, I've never seen Barry Bonds miss a ball like that, but happens to the best of them, kids, so hang with them. There are a lot of uh, white shirts and uh, bright shirts in this uh, shirt sleeve crowd today. Enjoying the sunshine and that's part of the ballpark. Brett Boone with the bounding ball to short. Aurelia throws him out. 
Two men gone. One of the bright spots for the Giants since Sean Dunstan has not been playing lately has been the development of Richard Rulia. He's played very, very well, and the Giants think of him as the shortstop of the future, and he's played well since he's been here. Now Joe Oliver back with the Reds. The Reds, right? the Reds are real happy with Tobinzi as their catcher. He's been playing very, very well. But today it's Joe Oliver's turn. Oliver had been with the Brewers last year and had a pretty good year for Milwaukee. And there were a number of teams interested in him as a free agent this winter, but not at the price that he was asking for, apparently. <laughs> and then finally ended up making a deal with Cincinnati because it was the only deal out there. Some of the teams that had made offers uh, uh, that he thought were not sufficient ended up taking them off the table because they made other arrangements for a catcher. Are you saying he overestimated his value? I'm not making a, any conclusions <laughs> on this, Joe. I'm just saying here's what happened. Now you make your own conclusion. <laughs> two balls, two strikes to count. But hey, when you go out and negotiate, you take a calculated risk. Right. You try exactly. to figure what your value will be. And sometimes guys are not always right. Maybe salaries don't always go up. So Oliver's back with the Reds. That's a base hit down the left of your line. Kind of mindful of a ball he hit to win a game in the 1990 World Series against the Oakland Athletics. I remember that well. It was against Dennis Eckersley, and it helped win a ball game and uh, helped the Reds sweep the Athletics in the four games in that World Series. So it late in the ball game, right down the line. It's a little, looks like a little slider. It doesn't break very well, but he pulls it right inside the bag, down the line, and he ends up with a double. So Joe Oliver at second base with two down and the pitcher John Smiley is coming up Oliver with only his seventh hit of the year in 35 at bats Oliver will be stranded and Smiley is thrown out by Robbie Thompson two to two as we go to the last of the second inning from San Francisco stay with us Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by the United States Postal Service. We deliver for you. And that's the look at the China Basin area. Here's Lefty O'Doul Bridge. Lefty O'Doul, a great hitter who was uh, quite a presence here in San Francisco for many, many years, both during and after his baseball career. And the Giants will be moving to that China Basin area into a neat, beautiful new ballpark where the uh, the right field area will be just right on the waterfront. It'll be 309 feet to the right field foul pole, Joe, at this new ballpark, but the wall will be 25 feet high. There'll be a 20-foot wide promenade behind the wall and then the bay. Well, we used to make reference to Willie McCovey when he hit a long home run, you say he hit it into the bay. That'll be a reality now. And that's at that ballpark, the new ballpark. And Willie Green. I'm not sure exactly what he was <laughs> trying to do on that one, Joe, but it didn't work. It, and I, I hope he never does it again. Aurelia is safe. Well, he made the right decision, and that was to charge the ball, but he just did not field it cleanly. Now watch, this is high bounce, and now he charges the ball. He actually gets there in time, but it hits off the edge of his glove. And there's no play at first base. Well, I'm going to go with those uh, white shirts again on this one. Well, you might be right, because he appeared to not see the ball clearly as it was going into his glove. And they scored that as a base hit for Aurelian. I don't know, maybe he's got great speed or something. Anyway, he gets the credit for a hit, and Tom Lampkin is a hurt man wearing a broken hand. Lost to the Giants for a while. So here is Lemkin in the eighth of the order. 2-2 ball game. Smiley the pitcher. Oliver comes back. And the ball is just back over the backstop. 
John, John, you know, you mentioned Lefty O'Doul, who was a, a great player for the Steel, played here a long time, and then was a presence in the city afterwards. Uh, Harry Callis, the announcer for the Phillies, his favorite place in San Francisco is O'Doul's. So he likes to go there and sing at night. He, Isn't that just down by Union Square? Yeah, down Union Harry Square. Harry likes to go down and sing? Yeah, Harry. And I would hate to see that. <laughs> I did one night. <laughs> I had to buy all the drink. <laughs> Take me out to the ball. Take me out with the crowd. That's not exactly what he was singing, but <laughs> you got the, you got the voice. <laughs> Center. Eric Davis, and he hauls it in. At number one, we're talking about the new ballpark that should become a reality by the year 2000. It would be the outer facade down there, and uh, there's a look at the uh, the channel, the China Basin Channel, with the Bay Bridge in the background. And then, if you were actually in the bay, maybe approaching on a ferry, and there will be ferry service to the new ballpark. That would be the look from behind the right field wall out there. And this is the, the look live, the present day home of the Giants. And candlestick point. And Landingham bunch it foul. One out, Aurelia at first. In the last of the second inning. Van Landingham is four for 14 this year as a hitter. So he can hit a little bit. And uh, Smiley, on the other side of things, he's already grounded out of his at bat. But he's five for 13. Two pitchers are going to hit. And one the can buck. The boom covering. And Aurelia moves into scoring position. And now they'll have one shot with leadoff man Stan Javier coming up to try and get him home. Nice putt there by Van Landingham. Gets the barrel of the bat out there. Look at that. Keeps it above the ball and just plays catch with it. Good, very good butt there. Two down, and here is Javier. Javier got an infield single his first time. I'm going to have to make the arrangements to be out here the next time the Phillies are in town, Joe. Eric Davis, and it's off his glove. Aurelia scores, and safe at second is Javier. What's going on out here? Yeah, we're not seeing very good defense, and actually, I, these are two pretty good defensive ball clubs. And Eric Davis, he seemed like he dove for that ball and appeared to me that he didn't have to die. The ball was still up when he got to it. We'll see how they score this one. Everybody who's made a, a shot at the ball so far has missed it by about six inches. Yeah, now watch this. Now the ball is still up. Now watch when he dies. See, the ball is still up. That's not your normal play where you have to die for it, but he does so, and they call it a double. It almost looked to me like Joe. Look, he was coming in one way, and then he had to make a dive to his left. Yeah, went the other way. But the ball was in the air long enough for him to be able to make the catch. Stan Javier gets credit for a double on that play. His second double of the year, so he gets an RBI, 3-2. to two. The Giants are out in front. Robbie Thompson, who walked his first time on the count of one ball to no strikes. <laughs> now the catcher, Joe Allen. <laughs> Maybe it's the glare of Sunday Night Baseball, Joe. We come to town and <laughs> the guys are pressing a little bit. Maybe that's it. What well, do you think? Oliver was set up outside and the ball was back inside. But, John, to make the real good point, sometimes it's not all poor pitching. Sometimes the defense adds to these numbers that the pitchers are putting up. I mean, because we've seen, I mean, that ball there was scored as a, as a base hit, but it should have been caught. Well, that reminded us of a play in the 1990 World Series. Well, Eric, Eric, yeah, Eric Davis. And he made a tremendous effort on this ball and hurt himself. Landed on his elbow there and uh, injured his kidney. And uh, that injury took him really years to recover from. He was never the same player after that injury as before. It's one of the reasons that he is so happy about being back in the game now. He took the year off last year, did not play. And... Uh, Finally got himself fully healthy for the first time in, in many years. Broken back, Willie Green. He handled it cleanly and made the play. The Giants are leading now, 3-2 to two as we go to the third inning. Top of the order with the Reds, Barry Larkin will be coming up third. 
getting a look at some great talent tonight. Barry Larkin, Eric Davis, Barry Bonds, Matt Williams. Next Sunday, Joe, we'll be able to see Albert Bell and uh, the Cleveland Indians and the California Angels, Chili Davis and the Jim Edmonds and company. Some great talent next week as well. Well, last year, we were, we were trying to decide about the middle of the season which one of those teams was the best offensive team in baseball. I think the Indians finally won out, but a lot of talent on the California Angels ball club. Leading it off of the Reds is Eric Owens, the leadoff man in the lineup, and he fouls one out of play. The count is 0-2 as he faces William Van Landingham. 3-2, to two, the Giants are out in front of this ball game now. Next Sunday, Albert Bell and those Cleveland Indians, Tim Salmon from the California Angels. You know, the Angels got up to kind of a slow start this year, but they won again today, and it seems like lately they're playing like the Angels we saw last year. They've won six in a row, and they're just a game and a half back of the Red Hot Texas Rangers over there in the American League East at Cleveland. How surprising. <laughs> Cleveland has the best record in all of Major League Baseball, just as you might expect. 20 and 9. They beat the Mariners today up in Seattle. Two and two the count to Eric Owens. And talk about interest in baseball, Joe. We were there opening night. We saw the 57,000 at the Kingdom. This weekend, 38,000 Friday, 57,000 last night, and 56,000 plus today at the Kingdom. Well, we, we made a point of noting that when we were there for that playoff game. Strike three call. That's the fact that the Mariners had done such a good job. All of a sudden, that was a great mecca for baseball. You know, I went down to the clubhouse before the game, John, because they were having a birthday cake for Willie Mays. And he was supposed to be there at 335, so I waited around. I was going to get a little piece of the cake. And uh, he's 65 years old tomorrow. And no. Yes, he is. And uh, I didn't get a piece of the cake no. because he wasn't there when I had to come on the air. Not to me, Joe. He's not 65 to me. Not to me either. You're right. Tomorrow but, is actually his birthday. Yes. May the 6th. And if you grew up around here, I mean, that was just one of those Holidays. statistics that you knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I won't be uh, in school tomorrow, uh, Teach, because it's Willie May's birthday. <laughs> Here's Hal Morris, and he was safe in the Barry Bonds error. One ball, one strike to Morris. Well, Willie Mays will be celebrating his birthday tomorrow, and uh, we're hoping to get some of that birthday cake anyway up here. And we're also uh, hoping to have a visit from Willie. Well, I don't mind Willie coming as long as he brings the cake. <laughs> It's all about the cake. All about the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Three and one the count out of Hal Morris. One out, nobody on here in the third inning. In the ballpark that uh, Willie Mays helped open back in 1960. That's a foul. They talk about how the ball is flying out of here. And we've, we've shown the dimensions are so shallow in some of the power alleys here this year. When they opened this ballpark in 1960, it was very deep out there and left. And Willie Mays is here with us, Willie. Uh, hi, John. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, thank you. How you doing, young fella? Hey, John. <laughs> you'll bring you some cake in a few minutes. All right, okay. good. Well, as long as you brought the cake, we'll let you go there. This yeah, is a big issue to... for Joe, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need that. Happy birthday, Willie. This is the little party before the game. They taped that? Yes. <laughs> Hey, I was down there waiting for you. <laughs> you know, we should have called up. I'd have been there. I want to sing happy birthday to you as well. Thank you. So your godson and his Barry Bonds down there for that. In the left center, Stan Javier. And that's out number two. Now, Willie, when this ballpark opened in 1960, I mean, left center field, it was, you had to hit it in those permanent bleachers out there, left field. So if I'd have had a ballpark like this, I think I could, probably could have hit another 100 home runs. Uh, when I came here, the bleachers was the home run. It wasn't. A, we didn't have that little fence out there. Uh, we had to hit it in, in the bleachers. What you see, what those people sitting out there? That was home. That was our home run. Well, you had to hit them over those bleachers they have in left field now. Yeah, just yeah. even about 30 feet farther than that. So. Yeah. Well, we didn't have that fence. If we'd have had this kind of fence when I played, I think I could have, you know, jumped a, little, a few more times. Hit a few more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Larkin, the hitter, with two down and nobody on. Larkin hit a home run his first time. It's three to two. The Giants are leading. This uh, start by, uh, by Barry Bonds. 
I mean, this is a, a maze-like start. Well, uh, I talk to Barry every year in spring and always, you know, push him because I'll say, look at my record. You're never going to get this close. And he's trying to show me that he can do it. And I think he can. I think he's going to go to 400 pretty soon, you know, because he's got, uh, I would think, over 300 home runs. I think he got over 300 stolen bases. And if he can keep himself together health-wise, health I think he's going to do very well. Really, and short. Throws out Larkin, and the Reds go down one, two, three. Barry Bonds will be leading it off. Willie Mays is here with us at Candlestick. Three to two, the Giants lead the Reds after two and a half. We'll be back. And we're honored to have Willie Mays, one of the uh, the greatest there ever was to play this game. Thank you, Jeff. 660 home runs. And here's Barry Bonds, one of the greatest currently playing the game. And uh, you can still argue about it, maybe the best. I think he is. I think Clint Ken Gifford Jr. is right there, too. I don't. I think you don't don't leave him out. But Barry is uh, can do everything. I think he's uh, pretty much all around as far as I'm concerned. You know. Well, he, he can uh, do it all. A great defensive player. He's leading the league in home runs. He leads the major league in, in RBIs, and he's a great stolen base artist. I mean, you need a steal. I mean, he can go get it. Yeah, he can do that. But I don't. I don't really bother by April. I look for September around those years. But because April, anything can happen. The pitches are not strong. Uh, you can get a lot of hits, but. I think he'll be there in September, too. One ball and two strikes to Barnes. Mac Williams will follow. And then Mark Carrion, John Smiley on the mound for the Reds. And that's a ball. You watch a lot of ball games, I know, Willie. Do you think the explosion of home runs and run scored, do you contribute at all to poor pitching, or is there something else you're thinking about here? I think the ball is tightening, Joe. Uh, right. I think the ball is tightening. I think they have uh, brought in the fences a little more. Uh, in every ballpark, you see Bill they bring it in the fence maybe 10, 15 feet, and I think that's a difference because uh, I, I remember when I played, 4, 400 was about 410, 420. Right. And then we had 365 out there, so I think it's a combination of, of tight ball and short fences. And when you say tight ball, of course, that means it's a harder ball, so it travels further. It's like a golf ball. Yeah. Well, yeah. Two and two, the counts are very bottom. High in the air, along the left field line, in the corner is Owens, plenty of room, and Barry Bonds is retired. But you know, Willie, when you when you talk about Griffey, and this is the debate, you know, you, Griffey and, and Bonds, which one's better? But Barry Bonds does something that Griffey doesn't do, which is steal bases. Well, I, mean, I think Griffey's uh, a great defensive player. He hits home runs, hits for average. But even though he has great speed, he does not often steal. Well, that's what I'm saying all around. Uh, you, you can debate a lot of things. When I played, that was a, that was a lot of guys, better hitters, better uh, throwers, better hitters, a lot of things. But I was probably like the all-around player. And the Ken, the, the Ken Griffith Jr. can do a lot of things, but they don't want him to steal. I think he could steal if he wanted to. But uh, I think Barry can do it just by doing it. He can go out there and steal your base when you need it. And I think uh, that's really what the difference is, that he can do whatever he want to do. Well, and last week, when he hit his 300th homer, mm -hmm. he joined you, Bobby Bonds, and Andre Dawson yeah. as the, only the fourth guy in history, <laughs> to see Bobby, to have 300 homers and 300 steals in a career. Uh, he let me know that. Don't worry. <laughs> He'll be the first, but he, he, he wants to go to 400 now. I, I said, hey, if you can get to that, you'll be all by yourself, because I don't think anybody is around right now that's going to play uh, enough time to get 400 of, uh, home runs and, uh, and 300, 400 steals. Of course, uh, he would have to go away to join you as the only member of the 300 steal, 600 home run club. <laughs> I don't think he's going to play that long. <laughs> Two strikes to Matt Williams. Strike three call. And he goes down on strikes for the second straight time. That was a beautiful pitch there by Smiley. He had thrown him inside the first time up, and he threw two pitches in this at bat, and he paints the outside corner for strike three. You see? The catcher set up right on the outside corner, and Smiley hits the outside corner. Matt Williams knows it, and he just walks away. Now Mark Carrion. Now Willie Mays here with us, and, he, and Willie, you said that there were guys maybe who were better throwers. That's a base hit for Carrion. He's two for two now. And that keeps the inning going for Glenn Allen Hill. Mm -hmm. But you said there were guys who were better throwers, there were guys who maybe were better hitters, this and that, but not all around. And of course, in 1962, Maury Wills, who was just better than him. Well, that was that was one of the times I was disappointed as far as the most valuable player is concerned. And I think I might have hit 50 home runs that year, and I felt that I was most, the most valuable player. But Maury broke a record. I think he stole 103 bases that yeah, year. 104. And, uh, 104, so around that. And, if it had been 103, he wouldn't have gotten it. Well, I don't. I, 
I'm just saying, you know, when, you, when you're an everyday player and you can put those numbers on the board, you've got to get rewarded somewhere along the line. You now, know? are you still a little sore about that? Oh, no, no, no. I, I came in second about 10, 12 times, so I'm really not even... <laughs> but I, at that time, you said, my God, you, you hit this kind of numbers and you don't get anything from What can you do? So what they did, they put it in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and that's maybe that's, that's where it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've asked you this question before, so I know the answer, but I think the fans would be interested in interested in your answer most people consider you to be the greatest player ever lay of the players especially played against you who was the best player that you played against i think that the, the player that came the closest was roberto Clemente. Uh, as far as i'm concerned I, I i could be wrong but i thought he could do just about everything the reason that he's not up there uh, right with me i think he only hit about 20 25 home runs a year but he hit 360. he drove in 95 runs every year played every day and he had the best arm i thought Great arm. Great, but, very, but very how, good arm. How can we have this discussion and leave out Hank Aaron? Well, Hank didn't throw like these guys. I did not, I'm not leaving out Hank. You asked me a question. Uh, the question was, there who was the best ball out. player that I've seen? Uh, now, yeah. Hank didn't steal a lot of bases. Uh, he had a lot of home runs. He hit for average. Uh, uh, you're talking about all around now. Yeah. And I think the best one that came close to me was, was Roberto. Did you and Hank have a little competition going when you guys were the top two? Oh, no, oh, no. I, you, know, you know what the competition was? I kept it people. And I, Joe knows this many times. I would talk to him. When, I, when he goes in a slot, I would watch him from center field, and I would tell him. Yeah. To me, that helped me to, to make them realize that, hey, I want you to hit, and I want you to enjoy the game of baseball. And that's what I did with all the players, and I do it right now. So I, myself, I never worry about me playing. I worry about the other guys. And I think that's one of the things that has been lost in the transition, Willie, really, is older players helping the younger players. Mm -hmm. This is Barry Larkin at short. Over to Boone at second, forcing Mark Carrier, and that's the inning. Eric Davis will be coming up second when we return. Willie Mays here with us. Three to two Giants after the ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. We go to the fourth inning, the Reds with their cleanup man, Eric Anthony, right now filling in for the injured Reggie Sanders, leads it off, and then Eric Davis will come up second. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, and Willie Mays is here with us. Willie, who had two times in his career, hit more than 50 home runs in a season. He last did it in 1965, finished with 52 home runs that year, Joe. Not a bad year. That's a base hit to center for Anthony, and here comes... Eric Davis and of course Willie Mays was so good that young players who showed promise over the years were often compared to a Willie Mays and Eric Davis yeah. had those comparisons drawn this was 1987 Willie and well, Eric looked like a, he he could be a great player in those days okay look at the bat now Joe compared Clark. to what the girls wanted to be Jack Clark, Clark hit the ball oh, that's Jack Clark yeah okay. Eric Davis hit the wall man and then about 11 days later this is Jim Morrison hitting the ball now watch him, it looks like the same catch, but it's different. Eric Davis. I mean, it looked like Willie really he could do it. He could steal bases, he hit home runs. He was a great outfielder. When I first heard about Eric, I, I talked to him, I called him up and I said, don't get into that mold. That means that don't let people try and compare you to myself because you do your own thing. He had some, some about maybe three or four good years and after that, then he started going, you know, different direction. And I said to him, you know, you, you got to do what you can do for yourself. And he agreed on it. Right now, he'll tell me, he said, well, you know, I used to try and do things like you did. And I found out I got into a mold and I couldn't do it anymore. So I think you got to play your own game when you can and have, you know, fun with it. Runner at first, two and all the counts. And that's ball three from Van Landingham. Now, he told me something interesting, Willie. He said, being away from the game for a year, he has a new perspective on the game now. He says he enjoys it. He realized, hey, I missed the game. Mm -hmm. The game is for fun, and it wasn't fun, he said before. He was hurt all the time, but he also said he was stuck on the, the business part of the game. Well, now he says, he says, the heck with that. It's fun, and that's the way I'm going to approach it. Well, I approached that when I was 12 until I was 41, and I think I was having fun every, every day, and I think it's more important to go out on the field, have fun. The money's going to be there. Yeah, if you put the numbers there, they're going to pay you the good money, and that's, that's what it's all about. Fun is having to go out there and say, oh, boy, this is a beautiful game. You know, I enjoy playing it, and that's what baseball is all about. 3-1 and one to Eric Davis. He swung away in that 3-0 and oh pitch, fouled it off. Anthony at first, nobody out. Foul tips that one, and it's a full count now. Anthony 
who didn't see the signal from the umpire the foul ball took off the second there's Ray Knight the new manager of the Reds and uh, I think Ray was wondering if this game was that much fun after his team went through a nine game <laughs> losing streak here yeah. Well, it's a little different over there when you're not managing. You don't have to make the decision, you know. It's a little different now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, say when you're a coach, it's, everything's rolling. Yeah, you, you do what the manager wants you to do when you're coaching, yes. Anthony runs the ball. is down the right field line. It is a fair ball heading for the corner. Over to dig it out is Glenn Allen Hill. Being waved home is Anthony. Here's the relay cut off by Thompson, and the game is tied at Eric Davis. Yeah. Going the other way with a double to tie the ball game at three. And we'll bring up Willie Green. Well, good hitting here by Eric Davis. He takes the ball the other way, fastball away, and he lines it the other way. And by the time the Giants are able to get it back in, Eric Anthony, who was running on the pitch, scores easily. And Eric Davis ends up at second base with a double with no one out. Davis has been able to do that this year. His batting average is very poor, but. He's still the Reds' big RBI man. He's been able to produce. Well, if you look at that, look at that picture again, John, you'll see that uh, so, that ball, something was taken off that ball. That and a lot of times when he, you do that, he'll go the other way with it. If I was pitching, I would pitch him hard stuff up and in to make sure that he can't get the full extension on it. You know, that's something you never did. You never pitched. <laughs> <laughs> I pitched in high school, <laughs> and I got out of there very quickly. Willie Green, rather not the first his first time. One ball, one strike. We showed a couple of great catches by Eric Davis from uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about Barry Bonds and Ken Griffey Jr. And when we have a moment here, we understand Griffey made a, a great play up in That's Seattle right. today. Fantastic. It was a fantastic catch. As soon as uh, Willie Green's at bat is finished here, we're going to... Willie couldn't have never made a catch like this because they didn't have padding on the <laughs> fence that you could use to leap up. I mean, they didn't, remember you ran, they had regular fences. They didn't put padding on the fences for quite a while. I never ran into him, Joe. <laughs> you weren't supposed to. <laughs> Just drilled the center field. Javier going way back there, way back, and it's over his head. Eric Davis got a late break. Now here he comes. Aurelia with a throw home and hits the mound. And Van Landingham misses it on the backup. Wow. All the way to third goes Willie Green, and it is four to three. The Reds are on top. Well, the Giants are keeping the ball in the ballpark, which has been a problem for them, but they're not able to catch it. This ball was hit hard. Javier is playing a little shallow because the ball wasn't traveling that well to center field. But Willie Green puts a charge into this one, and he actually was on the wrong side. The ball was back over his right shoulder, and he was playing over his left shoulder. And by the time they get it back in, another run for the Reds and runner at third. It looked like they had a chance to throw out Davis at the plate, but Aurelius' throw hit the mound and took a giant hop over the head of the catcher. A double for Green, I imagine, with an RBI, and he goes to third on the throw home. The infield is in for Brett Boone, and there is strike one. And uh, no, it's not a double. They have scored it a triple all the way for Willie Green. So the Giants now in halfway, short and second. And the count is quickly 0-2. We still want to take you to Seattle to show you this catch that Griffey made today because we've got... John, let me here. come in on center field right now before I quit. And in a night like this, you have to play deep because the ball is going to drift out there a lot. And even if a guy hits a hard ball, he's not really going to hit it. You know, why you can, you know, control it in. He's going to hit it over your head a little bit. Well, Boone is down on strikes. We're talking about the Griffey catch. Let's go to Gary Miller. Gary? John, it happened in the sold-out King Dome with the Indians in town and Albert Bell at the plate. He smoked one. Ken Griffey Jr., who lost more than half his season last year in a similar play, has no fear. Total larceny goes over the wall, takes away a Bell home run. But Dennis Martinez was too much, and Eddie Murray hit his first home run of the year. 480th of his career. Indians cut out the M's 2-0. Mm. And Cleveland takes three out of four in that series. You know the key to that, that catch? is making sure that you get your feet into the, the leather there and right. pushing yourself up. I did that many times on the wide fence I hear that we had against you guys, uh, Cincinnati a couple of times. Uh, Tolan, uh, Tolan, you had over there? Yeah, Bobby Tolan. Bobby Tolan, yes. Actually, he had a ball. Now watch well, this kid. Well, here, look at this. Bobby Tolan hit this ball. 
And uh, you and uh, Barry Bonds both went for it. Ooh. So you see my fence? See that fence here? <laughs> 375. Yeah, but I went up very quickly here. And you caught the ball. I caught right the ball, ball, yeah. The infield is in. Joe Oliver, right to the shortstop, Aurelia, after checking the runner. Green at third. He throws out Oliver. That's two men gone. Reds with two runs home here, leading four to three in the fourth inning. Bobby Bond said that's the only time you and he ever collided like that because mm -hmm. he said you, you guys worked beautifully out there. <laughs> he, says, he says one of those balls that was just right dead between the two of you. Either you got to take it or you just have to let it go. The ball was going over the fence and I, I, I was the son of fielder that wanted to take everything and, and Bobby knew that but he was he was just there in the way. I told him get out of the way. You're in the way man. Let me catch the ball. Oh, he was a pretty good outfielder. Wasn't he? Well, he was. And he could throw too. I forgot to put that. He could throw and, and could play every day. John Smiley the hitter. Runner at third. The infield back. Normal depth. You got hurt in that play didn't you? Well yeah. For a couple seconds. Yeah that's all. Oh. Back to Van Landingham and that is the inning. Willie Mays. Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you John. Yeah well. Uh, a lot of people don't know I'm 65, you know, hey. I'm, I'm still going on. You're looking great. Thanks for being with us. Willie thank you Mays. very much. Thank you, John. One of the greatest. Always, you know, with was. you, Joe. Thanks. You know, we'll thank be back. you. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from San Francisco. Again, many thanks to Willie Mays, who stopped by with us. We go to the last of the fourth inning now. And the Giants are trailing the Reds again, four to three. Rich Aurelia, who got an infield hit his first time and scored a run, leads it off. Here's the seventh place hitter. And there's that high hard fastball from Smiley. Strike one. And that's a pitch that many feel in the game today should be called a strike by umpires. Well, it would definitely help the pitchers because that high pitch. Now off the mound to get it is Smiley. A low throw to first, but dug out by Hal Morris, and there is one away. Stay with ESPN for complete coverage of the Tour du Pont. Tonight at 12.30 Eastern, immediately following baseball tonight, we'll have coverage of today's fifth stage, and then tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, it's stage six. American Lance Armstrong leads Tony Rominger by 35 seconds, entering today's stage. That's the Tour du Pont tonight on ESPN. Here is the Tour du Lincoln, and he swings. It's a high fly ball out there in the sunshine. Eric Davis, and that is out number two. Well, we talked a little bit about the new ballpark that they're going to open up here in the year 2000, right in the city of San Francisco, down on the waterfront in China Basin. And that's a look at it, Joe. That's the, the San Francisco Open Bay Bridge there coming into the city. There's the Lefty O'Doul Bridge, and that's a look at uh, from right field toward the left field corner, and uh, uh, a, a, a good home run could land right there into the San Francisco Bay. You know, I told you you retired too soon. <laughs> no, no. If I, would, if I was still playing, I wouldn't couldn't sit here with you and then get to interview Willie Mays. You know, the last time I was going to interview Willie Mays was the World Series with the Oakland A's and the Giants. And I was standing on the field, and they said, let's go down to Joe in five, four, three, and the ground started to shake. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous about interviewing Willie Mays again today. <laughs> William Van Landingham takes strike three call. Six pitch inning for Smiley. He and the Reds are leading. Four to three, the top of the order coming for the Reds. Larkin up third. Welcome back to our Sunday game of the week. Gary Miller with you in the studios, updating you on other action around the majors. Phillies and Braves in Fulton County Stadium, and John Smoltz off to an outstanding start. Struck out nine. He leads the majors with 60 strikeouts. Got Mark Witten here, built a huge nine to one lead. He becomes the first six game winner. Joey Hamilton also won his sixth this afternoon. Back to you, Joe. All right, thank you, Gary. And uh, Harry Goins, the Reds leadoff man, takes strike one from William Van Landingham. Hal Morris and Barry Larkin will follow. Owens has popped a short and struck out looking in this one. He is 0 for 2. By the way, the Braves will be part of our Wednesday night baseball doubleheader with the Rockies, Larry Walker, Dante Bichette, Andres, the big cat, Galarraga got hot yesterday. Greg Maddox will try and cool off the Rockies. And then the, the Indians, Albert Bell, and the Athletics, Mark McGuire's back. Second half of the doubleheader, that's on Wednesday night baseball on ESPN. I think I'll drive over and watch that Cleveland and Oakland game. 
Cleveland, in fact, they'll be here tomorrow night to uh, open that series with Oakland. That's a lighter caught by Robbie Thompson. Timed his late perfectly. One down in the fifth. Well, Owens goes the other way with this pitch. You can see it's low and away, and he lines it. And Robbie Thompson times his jump perfectly and comes down with it. That ball was headed to right center field and maybe extra bases. I'd love to see that happen. I mean, sometimes you see a guy go up like that, and he's still on the way up when he catches it. <laughs> or he's, he's up a little too quickly. But they get up there just at the right moment. It's a, it's a thing of beauty. Well, I think that happens more to a little short second base <laughs> than anybody else. <laughs> Al Morris, safe for the Barry Bonds error in the first. Fly out to left center his last time. Big curveball there by Van Landingham. Two strikes to count. Barry Larkin is on deck. The Reds lead four to three. We're in the top of the fifth inning. Uh, fifth inning here in San Francisco. And Larkin awaiting his turn. Beautiful. Strike three call. And obviously that's not a pitch that Van Landingham has used a lot in this ball game. Uh, Hal Marsh is not expecting it. He swung it to slow curve, and this is re a regular speed curve ball. The other one was a slow curve. That's a regular speed curve ball that catches him looking. Good pitch by Van Lendingham. Now watch, you'll see the rotation there and it's breaking down and across the plate. Good pitch. Strike three. Four strikeouts for Van Lendingham. All have been called third strikes. Here's Larkin. A strike at fastball over the outside. Larkin has hit a two-run homer and he has grounded out for short. One for two. Barry Larkin, the MVP last year, didn't have the best numbers of any hitter in the league. A fly ball to straightaway center, shading the eyes with the glove. Javier, and that's it. Three up and three down. We're halfway through it. Javier, Thompson, and then Barry Bonds coming up. Four to three, Reds. Four to three, Reds over the Giants. Sunday night baseball. We go to the last of the fifth. Now, tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, it's the Colorado Avalanche and the Chicago Blackhawks in game three of the NHL Western Conference playoffs. The Avalanche won game two last night, 5-1, to one, as Patrick Waugh stopped 30 shots. That's the Avalanche and the Blackhawks tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. Hockey, the Stanley Cup playoffs. Here is... Stan Javier against John Smiley, and there's that beautiful changeup. Oh, no, Javier's had an infield single and a steal, and he has had a double and a run scored and a run battered in. So he's having a, quite a night as the Giants' leadoff man. This is coming back from an injury that limited him earlier this year. Broken back, cutting across green from third. There he is. One away. There's Barry Bond. And let's take a look at this. There's a new attitude with Barry Bond this year. As you see, he's called out on the third strike there. He had hit two home runs in this ball game, but he ends up getting kicked out. That's Mark Hirschbeck saying, get out of here. <laughs> and he throws him out of the ball game, and you'll see Bond, he's all upset. But the reason I told you that story is that after the game, Barry Bond saw that pitch again on replay. And he said it was a strike, and he went into the umpire's room, and he apologized to Mark Hirschbeck. And the other umpires, Bruce Froming, Ed Monahue, and Charlie Williams, said that's the first time that's happened. It doesn't happen that often. And they were really pleased that Barry Bonds took the time to do that. So I think there is a new, I shouldn't say new, there is a different attitude from Barry Bonds. I just think that Barry is kind of a complex individual, and sometimes he doesn't do things the way we would like him to do and he swing, no, says Harry Wendell Stack. It is one ball and two strikes to Robbie Thompson, who has walked and grounded out. But, I mean, how often does a player go back and admit to an umpire that he was wrong, especially when he's tossed out of the ballgame? Yeah. You know, I think sometimes I've, I've you never admit it. it. Well, I hadn't either. I've seen guys apologize about a pitch and say, okay, I was wrong. But after you get tossed out of the game, you're usually so angry at the umpire that you don't want to talk to him anymore. Uh, again, I've seen him say, I'm, you know, you were right about the pitch, but not after you've tossed me out of the game. But Barry Bonds went in and said he was sorry and that he made a mistake. And Bruce Fremming uh, commented afterwards, just, and, and we accept it as a positive yeah. because, it, <laughs> because it just doesn't happen yeah, that often. It just doesn't happen. So for all the people that think that sometimes his attitude is not what they would like for it to be, I mean, there is a different side to Barry. 
One and two to Thompson. Bonds on deck. And Smiley misses with that fastball. Two and two to count. And John, I've always felt that part of Barry's problem with the media stemmed from the way the media treated his father. Uh, he never felt that his father got the do that he deserved by all the things that Bobby had accomplished on the field. He was never given the status of even being considered for the Hall of Fame, etc. And, and it's interesting to me because every time Barry ties or breaks a record, it's one that his father had also accomplished. You know, the 30-30 home runs, Bobby did it more times than anyone. The 300 home runs, 300 stolen bases, Willie Mays, Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonds, and Andre Dawson. So, I mean, his father was a great player, and I always felt that Barry had a little problem with the media simply because of the way that the media had treated his father. That, and I mean, that's his father, you know, so he always felt he did not get what he deserved. And down goes Robbie Thompson. Uh, number two, and that will bring up Barry Bonds. Two down, nobody on. And Bonds is the possible tying run here. He has already singled home run tonight. Wide out to left. He now has 36 RBIs, leading the Major League in that category. And he leads the league with 13 home runs. But when he hit the base, hit the left field in the first inning, back to the middle, I said that they would pitch him inside the next time. The first pitch was way off the plate inside. And I would feel that they would not make a mistake in the middle of the plate with a fastball again. That's the breaking ball away. They're going to throw fastballs in, and the breaking ball away is the way they would try to pitch balls. And that's the reason he wears that gladiator band on his arm. Boone got a tough hop. Stayed with it next to him. Throws him out. The Giants go down in order. Seven in a row retired by Smiley. Anthony and then Eric Davis coming up. Four to three Reds. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by the more than 1,200... about the armband that Barry Bonds wears to protect his right elbow because he's had surgery on that elbow and he's afraid another blow there. Look at that, the, the pad that he uses. And the great thing about it, as you can see, it acts like it bends with his elbow and you see the number 25 on there. So Barry wears that every play appearance because if he says that if he gets hit on that elbow again and, not, and he's not wearing that, it could be a career-threatening injury. So that's why he wears that armband. Struck out, looking, and he has hit a double driving in a run. And the count is 0-1 to him. And Barry stands so close to the plate, and they pitch him inside, he is always susceptible to getting hit on that elbow. Davis with a high foul on the right field line. And Manningham working in with a fastball. And when Willie Mays was here with us, he pointed out that the close at the loss speed to Davis is liable to be much more dangerous than if you stay in there with the hard stuff. So keep an eye on what Ben Lanningham's doing with him here. There's been an old rule in baseball, hard stuff to the old guys and slow stuff to the young guys. <laughs> and high fastball. They also think that Eric is a much better low ball hitter, so they do like to keep the ball up. And yesterday, Dewey gave up a home run, and... Uh, he said he was trying to work him up. Well, he was trying, but the ball was still down, as we saw in the grand slam, you know, that he hit. That ball was not up. The ball was down. Two and two. Struck him out. Five strikeouts for Van Landingham. Two down in the sixth inning, and now Willie Green will come up. Good breaking ball here from Van Landingham, and we've seen the last couple of innings, he's gone to the breaking ball more and more. 
and you see it's just a little slider down and away and you see the drop of the hands and he doesn't raise them back up as high as he used to but he was always susceptible to the high fastball because he had the big hit and Willie Green and that uh, breaking ball misses one ball no strikes Green tripled home run his last time over the head of Javier in center field Willie really Mays said an interesting comment about that when you play in this ballpark on a night like tonight the wind's blowing around you have to play a little deeper because the ball will do some funny things and as we noted how Javier was playing shallow at that particular time but you have to remember also Javier had played in the American League he has not played a lot of games here at Candlestick Park to get used to all the changes that go on during a ball game and as you mentioned as well he's been on disabled list so he has missed quite a few games this year of course, uh, when they played their first home stand, they didn't play it here. They played it in. No, I'm in the wrong league. You're in the wrong league. You're in Oakland. Oakland was in Las Vegas. I'm in the right. State. I just hope I'm you in the weren't there league. with them. No, no. <laughs> One ball and two strikes to Willie Green. Time taken now. Javier used to be with Oakland. Right. So you're still thinking of him there, huh? And Oakland, uh, of course, opened in Las Vegas. Well, you're an American League guy. Well, while they chalk it over the mound, we want to tell you that tomorrow afternoon at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific, it's the ultimate in-line challenge. Athletes put their bodies and minds to the test as they try to conquer the high jump, speed course, and more. That's the ultimate in-line challenge. Tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. And down on strikes goes Willie Green. Yes, it's the ultimate baseball challenge. Matt Williams coming up. The Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week continues. Oh! ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by the more than 1,250 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the best parts in auto parts. Look at that, Joe. People still coming into the ballpark. What a traffic jam. <laughs> of course, that's... Uh, What's the name of that street? That's Lombard Street. Lombard, right. As Bill Cosby once said years ago, Mr. Ben, that's... They got streets that are so dangerous in San Francisco that they had the one that's so crooked and it has cemetery plots built right alongside the road. <laughs> Lombard Street is it, supposed to be the crookedest street in the world. And I mean, I mean, actually, a street that winds like is that. so yeah. non-straight that it's crooked. Not that crooked <laughs> things go on there. Here's Matt Williams. First ball swinging. Really green from third, and he throws him out. Matt Williams is going just like that. The first time he's hit the ball tonight, he has struck out twice earlier. Matt got a, a scare yesterday, just before the game. He got a call from his wife uh, that she was uh, having problems. Her heart was beating fast. Her fingers were numb. She was dizzy. So he left the ballpark, went to the hospital on the peninsula, and his wife Tracy uh, was diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat, but she was not admitted to the hospital. Williams came back to the ballpark, later got in the game as a pinch hitter, and later still hit a home run. But it was a very frightening episode for Matt and his wife, Tracy. But uh, the doctor reassured him everything was fine. This kind of shows you that real life things happen to baseball players, too. They have a lot of stress to deal with off the field as well as on. A lot of things go on, just like normal people. Carry on the hitter. Two for two. Green cuts across in front of Larkin on this one and throws out. Carry on. Two men down. Well, the Reds looking for their third straight win, and the Chicago Cubs got a big win today. Here's Gary Miller. John, deja vu. We even had to re-rack it for you. Sammy Sosu won a game on Friday when the Cubs last at bat. And already homered in this game, tied it for in the ninth. He launches a shot off Jerry DePoto, who called it a crummy pitch. But look where it lands. Across Waveland. It will throw the window. Take my word for it. Cubs win their last attack. Wow. Sammy Sosa. As there's a strike to Glenn Allen Hill. Thank you, Gary. Sammy with a two-homer game. Earlier this week, he had a three-run homer in the bottom of the ninth. With the Cubs trailing 2-1 to one against the Mets. To win that ball game 4-2. to two. That's twice in one series. That he wins the ball game in the bottom of the ninth. Well, we're talking about the fact that Barry Bonds joined Willie Mays and Andre Dawson and Bar Bobby Bonds with the 300 home run, 300 stolen bases. Of the players playing today, I think Sammy Sosa probably has the most legitimate chance of joining that group because he's a 30-30 person and he's had a couple of years in Chicago where he's hit 30 home runs and stolen 30 bases. 
Well, John Smiley is looking like the John Smiley that the Reds anticipated. He has retired 10 in a row. The Reds. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week. Here we go to the sixth inning. Or rather, the seventh inning now as uh, Brett Boone takes a called strike. Boone, the seventh place hitter, facing William Van Landingham. Boone is 0 for 2, a ground out and a strikeout. And it's ball one. Both pitchers have started to settle in. Van Landingham has retired nine in a row, beginning with Boone back in the fourth inning. And he misses there. And his counterpart, though, John Smiley, has retired ten Giants in a row. And Mike Ringering, the publicity director for the Reds, population, said that's the first time the entire season that Smiley has retired the side in order three half innings in a row. So that's the first time the entire season, he said. And of course, you're sort of damning John Smiley with faint things when you say that because yeah. I mean, it's not that impressive. Well, but that's the first time <laughs> that he's done that. That's the point. It tells you how bad making. he's yeah. been. Yeah. yeah. Three and one the count. And he walks him. Brett Boone is aboard, leading off the seventh inning. Now, Barry Larkin missed the game yesterday with the muscle spasms in his upper back on the left side. And they've been working on him here in the between innings as well in this ball game. trainer for the Reds working on Larkin now here is uh, Joe Oliver who has doubled and he grounded out to short Larkin told me before the game that the, uh, the area was still stiff so it might be part of the same problem that he's been having well I guess you're right maybe he wanted to come back and protect his job he's just losing his job because <laughs> if he's still stiff he probably shouldn't be playing <laughs> A little happier now. Just a little massage. Pitcher smiley on deck. Now Van Nanningham bluffs the runner back to first, Brett Boone. Boone uh, has also had some ankle problems here of late. Earlier he had the bone chips, he had some surgery on his elbow. And he's wearing the, uh, the longer sleeve there over the elbow. But his ankle's been giving a little trouble lately. He's running, the ball is bounced foul. Back behind the plate. Hit and run was on, but the ball fouled by Oliver. Four to three, the Reds on top in the seventh. Now, it's not unusual, Joe, out of sight from even cameras and, and the fans for trainers to be working on players right now. Oh, in the middle no, of the during the game. game. You, if you have a little tightness in your hamstring or tightness in your back, we will try to stretch you out. The, uh, the visiting dugout at Candlestick Park is unique, though, in all of Major League Baseball. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Yeah, I want to hear this. Well, you know one already. That is power. Okay. Because all dugouts in Major League Baseball are connected by a, a subterranean tunnel to the clubhouse and, uh, by extension, the trainer's room, except the visiting dugout at Candlestick is connected to nothing. The, tr the visiting clubhouse is way down the right field line. You've got to cross the entire field to get down there. So when they're in the dugout during the game, the trainer's got to work on them right there. Yeah, I guess I didn't know <laughs> Memory's starting to go. <laughs> I didn't mean you personally when I said I'd tell you why. Oh, okay. And then our fans out there. John, I had an interesting conversation with Glenn Allen Hill before the ball game. He played the Cleveland Indians a high compliment. He said last night he was watching some highlights of their season last year, and he said the greatest thing he saw was how involved all the players were into the game. The extra men on the bench, how they were cheering, and how they were, you know, rooting for the other Team, their teammates and he said that's what we need here and he was talking in front of some of his own teammates when he told me that but I think he was trying to spur them on to being a little more vocal during the ball game there's Harry Wendell said he was first base on fire behind but he should tell them he shouldn't tell you not when he was telling me in front of some of them was it they were in the earshot they they got the message right center field into the alleyway that one's in there for a base hit and gets by here comes Boone. He's being waved home. He will score. Heading for third is Oliver. And he's got a triple. Five to three. Cincinnati. Javier was over toward left center. 
And uh, just could not get there to cut that ball off. A triple for Joe Oliver. Well, Oliver pulled one right down the line, you know, for a double. And now his last, and now he goes the other way. And this ball here is in the gap in right center field. Actually, Glenn Hallen Hill, if you watch, he may have had a ch better chance of cutting this off. He slowed down and gave way to the center fielder. And Javier could not make up the ground. You see, he'll slow up right there. And the ball gets past Javier. I'm sure that Hill, if he would have been able to go all out, may have been able to keep that ball from going all the way to the wall. Well, instead of pulling up, shouldn't he have crossed behind Javier? I mean, to, to still go for it in case Javier didn't get it? Might, might just slow him up. Well, I was yelling at him, go behind him, go behind him, but I don't think he heard me. <laughs> no, I agree with you, and that's usually what happens with, quite often we see outfielders cross, and that's the reason for that. that. That way they do not have to slow down or they can go after the ball full force, and he's supposed to back up the center fielder. Bullpen activity for the Giants. The infield is in. Ben Lanningham knocks that ball down off the bat of Smiley. Keeps Oliver at third and throws out Smiley, who is now 0 for 3. Bullpen activity for the Giants. Right-hander Rich DeLucia has come to loosen up down the right field line. Just back from an injury. Actually from some surgery. And there's Dusty Baker, who's Giants have not been able to beat the Reds all weekend. Everybody was beating the Reds. They've lost nine in a row. But John, if you're a team that's playing pretty well, the last thing you want to see is a team come in on a long losing streak because percentages in baseball usually have a way of evening out. So you know that they're going to win a ball game sooner or later, and they've lost nine in a row. That's not the time you want to play the Reds, really. Dusty Baker perhaps thinking that, well, I know he's thinking that they were going to try a suicide streak. He pitched out there that first pitch to Eric Owens. Owens is 0 for 3 and has not hit the ball out of the infield yet, although he hit a line shot that was caught by a leaping Robbie Thompson his last time. The infield is in. One out. Five to three Reds. Well, the Reds have sacrificed a lot, so, and Ray Knight will use the bunt. He will use the squeeze, but. Well, if you're going to do it, is, is this the time, 2-0? Oh? Well, I, I don't believe that this is the time to do it. I think 2-0, oh, you let the guy pick a pitch and try to drive it someplace. But you do realize they're not going to pitch out 2-0 you know, unless you break too quickly. 3 you know. See, That would not have been a good time, see? <laughs> <laughs> and there's Dusty Baker, or Johnny B, nicknamed Dusty. I like suicide squeezes. Well, I didn't as a hitter, but, I mean, it does work sometimes. And as a fan, I like to watch it. That's ball four, a four-pitch walk. And that will bring up the left-handed batting. Hal Morris, but DeLucia continues to heat up in the bullpen. And here comes Dusty Baker out of the Giants' dugout. First and third, one out. And the Giants needing to do something here just to stay in this game. They're already down by two. Looks like Dusty going to make a double switch. He's got the pitcher's spot due up third in the last half of this inning. So he's given the info to Larry Poncino, the plate umpire. DeLucia is coming in. And we'll be back. Reds lead five to three. Last uh, or the top of the seventh inning, the Reds five, the Giants three. The view from the right field foul pole is the Reds. Hal Morris comes to the plate, and Rich Delucia on the faces. The infield halfway at short and second, and because uh, he, he can't get him, he had that double fake, and it almost nailed Eric Owens, the rookie. He started to go, and Delucia bluffed toward third. It was almost like DeLucia just assumed that nobody would buy it. And he was not real quick in getting the ball back over the first. Well, very rarely does that work. On the double switch, David McCarty came in to play right field, replacing Glenn Allen Hill. McCarty will hit ninth, and DeLucia in the number six spot, and he will be the ninth hitter the next go-round through the order. Now, back to first is Owens. Looked uh, fairly obvious Owens was going to try and steal there. Rich DeLucia had some surgery. And after all of the rehab work and everything else, he finally got back to the big leagues yesterday. Got in an inning of work very successfully. And Morris takes a strike. He pitched the ninth, uh, actually pitched an inning in the third yesterday and struck out the side in the ninth inning. There's Oliver, who just hit his 
second career triple. He's at third, and there is Owens, who walked at first base with Mark Carrion on the back with him. One strike to count to Morris, who's 0 for 3. And Owens is back again. Yesterday, the Reds uh, pulled off a double steal, Joe, after the grand slam was hit by Davis to give them the lead. They then pulled off a double steal to score a run with their first and third situation. Owens has five steals already. Even though he started the year in the minor leagues. One ball, one strike. Well, Ray Knight is an aggressive type manager. He likes to hit and run. He likes to do a lot of things. I mean, he was that way as a player. He liked to hit and run. And he always wanted to put the runner in motion to open up a hole, and he figured he could put the ball in play. So he is an aggressive type manager. Fans leading five to three. The Reds trying to extend their lead here. And the Giants trying to hold the line, which could well be the difference between winning and losing for them. If they could keep it at two runs, they've got the power to come back. But if it gets much worse. Maybe enough for the Reds. Have stolen 44 bases this year in their first 28 games. So they've got a lot of speed up and down the lineup. Larkin can steal. And so can Eric Owens. Also, they've got Vince Coleman on the roster now. Eric Davis can steal. Owens not going. The pitch misses. Ball two. Well, John, they need a lot of speed because they do not have a lot of power on this ball club. They lost Ron Gant. Reggie Jefferson is out. So, I mean, uh, uh, Sanders, I keep saying Jefferson, Reggie Sanders is out. And so they need to make up for the loss of the power by using their speed. Well, he's going now, don't you think? Two and one? Owens, is he going? I would say no. Oh, come on. Not now, anyway. He may when he pitches. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Branson has come out on deck rather than Barry Larkin, who was due up next so. He may be having those spasms again. Right. I don't think you hit and run in this situation if you're going to bring up another left-hander. If you had a right-hander on deck, you may try to stay out of the double play and go ahead. But you do not want to take the batter of a guy like Hal Morris's hand. And look at Larkin. Looks like he's got uh, some something. Well, probably a warm heating pad. Yeah. Lucia thinks he's going. He's holding the ball. He's convinced. Yeah, he is convinced. So maybe you and Rich are right. He's going into the four corners here. <laughs> he's just going to stall it out. Rich, there's no clock. I got news for you, buddy. <laughs> and Rich, I don't think he's going. John does. He's not going. I can't believe it. Well, I can't. All three. All right, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to give you another chance. What do you think? No, I don't even care if it goes now. <laughs> three and one. Yeah, all right. I'm, 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 they're all going now. Three and one. We know he's three going. Three and one. You know he's going. Yeah, he's definitely going. There he goes. Ball four. So the bases are loaded. Branson coming up now for Barry Larkin. Larkin, of course, put the Reds ahead back in the first inning against Van Landingham. It went the other way to that shallow power alley in right center. And I think he got a little assist from the wind as well, but a two-run shot nonetheless. His fifth home run of the year. Now he is out of the game. He had muscle spasms in the upper left back near the shoulder that kept him out of the game yesterday. And he may well have similar problems here. Jeff Branson hitting 311. This ball one. The bases are loaded. The Reds with a chance to break it open. Oliver, who tripled, is at third base. Owens, who walked at second. And Morris, who just now walked against Delusia, is at first base. And Branson has always been a good hitter. Bullpen activity for the Giants, meanwhile, is Delusia. Doesn't look like the same pitcher who worked here yesterday. There's Jeff Juton. J-U-D-E-N. Great big guy. Six feet eight inches tall up for the Giants bullpen. Five four. Middle infield double play down. 
and it's 3-0. Well, John, I think one thing you have to remember, you talked about the fact that yesterday was his first outing of the season. They just came off rehab. To have to pitch two days in a row may be the problem. He just may not be sharp enough to do that yet, to pitch two days in a row. One more for that with the Giants. The left-hander gets up out there now. Swinging away in 3-0. This should get Oliver home. Javier. He fell down. He made a Willie Mays basket catch out there after slipping. Oliver scores easily. And it is 6-3 for the Reds. Well, I guess this catch is in honor of Willie Mays' 65th <laughs> birthday. And uh, the right. fan knew that Willie was in the, in the ballpark. Now watch, he slips here for a second. Right there, he slips. Now he realizes, hey, I can't get under it. So he makes the basket catch. And he throws it back in. And Branson gets a sacrifice fly on a 3-0 and count. He's pitch. trying to get a little momentum to make the catch on the run to get a little more power behind the throw. And as you say, he slipped and made the basket catch. Well, he didn't tap the glove, though, the way Willie did. But that's unusual. I mean, you take... Uh, that shows you that Ray Knight manages to a different drummer there. I mean, to let a guy swing 3-0 and with the bases loaded, that's very unusual, yeah. and he had walked two hitters in a row. Delucia had only thrown one strike in his first eight pitches after entering the game. 1-0 and the count to Eric Anthony. Two runs in, the Reds are leading 6-3. to three. Come on. And this, well, again, Delucia can't find the strike zone here. Inside baseball talk there right from the dugout, Joe. I don't know if I understood it, but I heard it. Pretty good whistle, too. <laughs> Three and oh. Delusion just can't get the ball over. Eric Davis is on deck. The well, man who hit a grand slam yesterday. Well, I think all he has to do is get it close, though. Three and oh. I'm sure if Branson was swinging with the bases loaded, Eric Anthony will be swinging with two outs and runners at first and second. Your, your cleanup hitter. Yeah. I think Delucia knows that as well now. He learned something the last time. Yeah. <laughs> not only was he swinging, he didn't. He missed it entirely. That's not good. You swing a three and oh, you better hit it. Well, it was also a ball. So that will be the last time he gets the green light on three and oh. <laughs> Ray Knight learned something about him right there. That he will chase that three and oh pitch. It Ray's got some spasms now. Ray is very unhappy at this moment. And it's strike two. Well, so looking at that, Joe, he may be the first guy ever to give a guy a takes on in three and two. <laughs> three and two, two men on, two men out here in the seventh. One's at second, Morris at first. There they go. And it's the walk. The fourth walk of the inning issued by Giants pitching. The second issued by Delucia. And Eric Davis coming up with the bases loaded. Yesterday with the bases loaded. Here's what happened. He faced Mark Dewey. And it was the grand slam for Eric Davis. Yeah, but you can see that pitch was not up. That pitch was down and out over the plate. And Eric can handle that pitch very well. And here's Dusty Baker. Delucia. Not the same pitcher who came out here yesterday. And this was kind of a test, though, as you mentioned, yes. Bill, for a guy coming back from surgery. So Baker is called to the bullpen for another right-handed, Jeff Juden, to come out and face Eric Davis and to bring the gas with him. We'll be back. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by The Home Depot, where low prices are just the beginning. From Candlestick Park, the Reds six, the Giants three. John Miller with Joe Morgan and the Reds now with a chance to bust it wide open. Eric Davis, who just hit a grand slam here yesterday against a reliever who had just come into the game to face him in yesterday's situation. It was Mark Dewey. Now Jeff Juden, six feet, eight inches tall. A guy who was taking off about 40 pounds from uh, last year. And right now, the Giants would like to have him take off a 
a few runs that the Reds are planning to score. The bases are loaded. And that's what he's going to do. That's the 90 mile an hour heater on the inside. The base runners. Owens at third. Morris at second. Anthony at first. They all got there with a walk. And that's the question about Juden. If he can throw strike, he has a good fastball. Big chop. Powell on the third base side. One ball, one strike. Giants have put uh, Juden not only into a, a, a weight control kind of a program, a whole nutritional program, exercise, and he says it's the, the best kind of a program that he's ever been put on, and he, you can see he's much more svelte than he used to be. The gas on the inside, strike two call. And Davis didn't seem like that call. They never like it when that inside <laughs> pitch is called a strike. That's well, a good fastball. See the catcher's target. Well, Davis thinks it's way inside. It wasn't that far if it was off the plate. Davis is the eighth man to bat in this inning. He struck out twice today, but he's also doubled home a run. Two down, three men out. High in the air to center. Javier going back. He's at the warning track. He's at the wall. It's a grand slam. Two days in a row. So Eric Davis repeating his triumph of yesterday when they brought in a reliever to face him and he hit a grand slam and he has done it again. Well, this is a different type pitch. This is a high fastball, the pitch that he was not supposed to be able to handle. And it's a high fastball and he hits it over the center field fence. Now watch this pitch. They say he can't handle a high fastball. Look at this pitch. That one's up there. May have even been out of the strike zone. Watch. And he gets up there and hits it over the center field fence. And there's strike one to Willie Green. He has a triple in three at bats. The Reds have broken it open. Eric Davis, five more RBIs today. Nine RBIs the last two games here. The count now 0-2 to Green. It is 10-3 for the Reds. And it's kind of exciting to see, you know, unless you're a Giants fan, of course, but exciting to see a, a player like Davis who's been able to come back and uh, all of a sudden to put it together here for two days, just like the old days for Eric Davis. Just like the days when he was supposed to be the next Willie Mays. And down on strikes goes Willie Green. The Reds bat around. Six runs have scored. And the Giants are being booed off the field. His career was over. That's what we thought. Eric Davis out of baseball last year. It seemed that time and the injuries had conspired against him. But he had the dream that he would come back. He missed the game. He started feeling healthy again after all the injuries. And Davis indeed has made that comeback. And now these last two days, that comeback has accelerated. Two grand slams and nine runs batted in in the last two games here in San Francisco. Aurelia the hitter against John Smiley. How's it back? Smiley now, who has retired 10 in a row, has a seven-run lead with which to work. And of course, he is one of the keys for the Reds, as you see Eric Davis back out there in center field. He said uh, he had the new perspective of realizing that the game was fun and had fun. And, uh, He's having more fun than anybody right now. Well, he had said the game had become where it was a, a, like working because of all the injuries, et cetera, and that's when he retired. And he found out he missed the game. And as you said, it, some of the injuries healed, and now he's having more fun than anyone because he's back. I would think the same thing with Ryan Sandberg in Chicago. You know, you go away from the game, and you realize this was fun. I enjoyed that. And you come back, and it's got to be very exciting for him. He left the game for, for a different reason. Right. But both came back. And foul off to the right. Hal Morris. He's got it. One away. I want to show you something about Eric Davis. They said he couldn't hit the high fastball. Well, yesterday, Dewey was trying to throw the ball up, but you'll find that this pitch is down. This is not up. And he hits it out of the ballpark. Now, watch pitch location. Ball is down and he drives it out of the ballpark. Today, this pitch is going to be in this area, up with a fastball. And he drives it out of the ballpark, so maybe he's learned to hit the high fastball as well. He could always hit the low fastball. He certainly hit that one. That's a foul by Lampkin. 
Oliver is kind of make it fair, but it was a foul ball. Oh, and on the count. Eric Davis, his seventh career grand slam. All seven hit with the Reds. He never hit one uh, with the Tigers or with the Dodgers. Lampkin takes a ball from Smiley, one and one. Only two Reds in history have hit more grand slams while with the Reds than Eric Davis. Johnny Bench with 11, and George Foster with nine. Foster seemed like he hit all nine that one year. <laughs> 1977, he hit 50, what, was it 52 home runs? 52. Eric Davis. Having fun, there's no question about it. We know he's having fun. That's a call strike to Lampton. Lampton is 0 for 2. McCarty is on deck. Two balls, two strikes to count. Players get caught up in the, the tides of the moment, the negotiations. Are you still talking about Oliver? I'm not, I'm not talking about Oliver, but I'm talking about the business side of it. Okay. That's, what, that's what Davis said. He, he said. he said the injuries made it hard. He was always in pain, but also he said he was caught up in the business of baseball. It had become a business to him. Mm -hmm. And with the removal from the game, getting healthy again, he started to realize the fun of the game. And it's, I'm sure, difficult to, to keep that in mind when you're in the middle of it sometimes. If you think about it, Willie Mays kept talking about fun, fun, fun. 3-2 pitch, left center, and over comes Eric Owens, and that is out number two. Tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, it's the Colorado Avalanche and the Chicago Blackhawks. Game three of the NHL Western Conference playoffs. The Avalanche won game two last night, 5-1. to one. Joey Sackett scored his second, uh, let's see, his ninth, his ninth, oh boy! And that's a playoff leading total. The Avalanche and the Blackhawks tomorrow night, 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. Sackett has got nine goals. And what's the goalie for the Colorado? Wow. Patrick, wow. Well, why would they spell it R O Y? I uh, cannot tell you. <laughs> I'm not, not so sure. Mr. <laughs> Mulder. <laughs> that was pretty weak, wasn't it? One ball and no strikes to McAlty. I think it was pretty good imitation. Well, it is. I'm looking at you, okay? But I still like the, you know, Harry Callis. I think the Harry Callis pretty good. Harry singing at Lefty O'Doul's. <laughs> Smiley, who's had problems uh, after the early innings in other games this year. It's been the opposite. He gave up three runs in the first two innings, and now he's on a roll. Twelve in a row, retired. He's given up only one hit since the second inning. Johnny's also changed his motion a little bit. He's going a little bit more to a hesitation at the top of his lineup, right there. He's hesitating just a little bit more than he was at the beginning of the ballgame. And he has issued his second walk. McCarty takes the walk. Now watch his delivery. Even though this is slow motion, you will see a slight hesitation. Well, you couldn't see it in the slow motion, but he hesitates just a little bit more behind when he drops his arm down right now than he was at the beginning of the, of the ball game. Don Gullett, the pitching coach, out to speak to Smiley. Gullett, a pretty good left-hander in his own right before injuries took their toll on him. Two down in the last of the seven. The Reds are leading 10 to three. We saw the game-winning home run by Sammy Sosa today for the Cubs. And of course, that was very relevant to the Reds because the Reds are in that National League Central. With the Cubs, the Cubs have a half-game lead over the Pirates, one over Houston, two over St. Louis, and the Reds with a win here will remain three out to this. Still alive. Javier bunts the ball, but foul. Javier, two for three for the run battered in, in this game. Even with all the losses. I'm going to make a point here. You know, when Tony Perez was the manager, they were 20 and 24 when he was fired. I think the Reds have to go 9 and 7 just to get to that record now. I don't think Ray Knight should be fired, but I didn't think Tony Perez should have been either. So I think they're in a similar situation. This one fielded by Brett Boone, and that's all for Javier and the Giants. The Reds are having a party at the Giants' expense, 10 to 3. Eric Davis, a grand slam to bust 
it open. Ray Knight. He's enjoying this managing job. The ESPN <laughs> Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week. And here we go to the eighth inning. The Reds coming up with Brett Boone, who started that six-run seventh inning rally with a walk. Taking ball one from Jeff Juden. Third Giants pitcher of the game. The man who gave up the home run to Davis. Look at it. Fred Boone kind of dives into the ball a little bit anyway, and Juden is missing off the plate inside. Not your perfect combination here. Now watch, watch where Boone starts in, and that ball is tailing way inside. Juden has never been a guy that's been known for his pinpoint control. 3-0 the count. That's one in there for a strike. 3-1. Joel Oliver is on deck. The Reds' bullpen is busy. Ooh, the high hard one, three and two. Kind of like the one Davis hit over the wall, isn't it? Well, Br Brett doesn't get cheated up there. I mean, he attacks the ball. Brett, son of Bob, who is the Royals manager. Pops a foul back out of play. That was a pretty good trade that they picked up with him. You see the bullpen, uh, McElroy, the lefty. And Tim Pugh, the right-hander, coming up in the Reds' bullpen. So an interesting conversation that his father, Bob, made about a sports writer here in Kansas City. He was always second-guessing. Smash! Right past Matt Williams and into left field. Bonds over to cut it off, and Boone will hold with one. I was told that the infield here is not as good as it has been in the past. They've added a little more dirt to it. And I tell you what, this ball here takes a weird hop. Matt Williams tries to get in front of it, trying to try to short hop, and you see that ball bounces up. Got a little piece of him as it went into left field, but very tough hop to manage there. Hit for Boone, his first of the game. Here is Joe Oliver. Oliver hit a triple in that six-run, seventh-inning rally. And that was one of the two hits the Reds got in that inning. They got six runs with two hits. Four walks, right? Yeah. And all of the walks became runs. All of the walks. Steve Scarsoni just in the lineup for the Giants at second base. And he throws out Oliver as Boone moves over to second. Ray Knight, the Reds manager, talked to us earlier about the criticism he's received for lacking patience. I think the tendency is when you're aggressive and maybe a little hyper, uh, people tend to think you're not patient, but I've always been a very, very patient man. That patience has been tested. Uh, I think I, I've weathered the storm, though. I know personally I only had one day that I, one game I really felt anxious about, and that was about our, after our sixth loss, I came out and said that the seventh game was a must-win game, which is kind of stupid, but, um, but I, I, I'd gotten through this part pretty well. <laughs> well, if he's gotten through this part, he can only get better now. He can get through anything. Thomas Howard pinch hitting for Smiley. He hits a long high drive way back there. It's gone. A pinch hit home run for Thomas Howard. His first home run of the year. It is 12 to 3. Now they're turning it into a lapper. Although nobody in the Giants side is laughing. Third home run of the game for the Reds. And they hit four home runs here yesterday. And the Giants, they add to their total. They've given up more home runs than anybody in the league. This is a fastball that gets right into the middle of the plate, about belt high. And Thomas Howard says, I know what to do with that one. And he just kind of deposits it into those temporary bleachers in right field. Or is that center field? I call it center field since it was over that 365 marker, but almost just to the right of straightaway center. Well, the Reds celebrating in their dugout. And of course, they well know that they're right in the middle of the, the race there in the central division. The first place team, the Cubs, only one game over 500. The Cubs just snapped a seven game losing streak last weekend. And they're in first place. One strike to count. And that fastball is in there. Strike two to Owens, who is 0 for 3 with a walk. Bullpen activity with the Giants now. Well, the Reds are 11 and 17 starting today's ball game. Scarsoni, nice 
strange. I don't think you feel like you're in a race until you get at least to 500. Because no one in the division, you're not going to win a division unless you play 500 baseball. Well, we should we, I say that. that you, used to, you used to be able to say that. But now when we got three divisions and a balanced schedule. Yeah. Well, I still believe there will be a winner in each division that will have at least a 500 record. I hope better. so. I hope yeah. so. I hope much better than a 500 yeah. record. Here's Hal Morris. You see the Central Division standings there. Morris takes a strike. He's 0 for 3 with a walk. 12 to 3. The Reds with 12 runs with nine hits. Barry Bonds. And that retires the side. Two more Reds runs. Reds 12, Giants 3. Scarsoni, then Bonds and Williams. Barry Bonds will be up second here in the eighth. Tonight in Sports Center, the Sunday conversation is with Barry Bonds. How much farther can he go? And 500, 500 for me, you know, I can reach it. Another seven year grind, but I'm physically fit. And I'm not a person who has a lot of injuries and, and, you know, knock on this couch and wood somewhere. And, you know, I'm, I've been very fortunate throughout my career and I can do things that you know, I, I never thought I would ever, I ever dreamed of doing. Sony with a count of two and oh, Bonds on deck. As Willie Mays uh, said, he, he tries to sometimes sort of kid around with him and issue a challenge at the same time. As you see Chuck McElroy on the pitch now for the Reds in relief of John Smiley. Even Bonds admits, though, Joe, that they get 500 steals. I mean, if you still be out there stealing 30 bases at age 38, that might not happen. That's ball four to Scarsoni. New left fielder Thomas Howard, who pinch hit for Smiley, stays in the play left field. And McElroy enters the game as the pitcher, hitting in Owens' number one spot in the order. Barry Bonds, a single homer run, fly to left and ground to the second. One for three. Nice ball for a strike. Matt Williams on deck. That entire conversation with Barry Bonds coming up on Sports Center. After Sunday night baseball. 12 to 3, the Reds are leading. Now Barry Bonds facing Chuck McElroy, Joe. This is not something that he looks forward to. I <laughs> know. Uh, One hit in 22 career at bats for Bonds against McElroy. Well, you can tell that he's unsure because he was not a, a, quite as aggressive against him as he was smiling. Ooh. Just missing for a ball. One and two. John, in talking to Barry, his immediate goal is 40-40. The 500, 500 is way off, and he would like to match Jose Canseco's 40 home runs, 40 stolen bases. Well, down on strikes is Barry Bonds. McElroy just blew it past him. And that was interesting because everything he threw in was away, and I think Bonds is unsure about if they're ever going to come inside, but every pitch that McElroy threw him was toward the outside corner, and because they pitch him inside so often, the Reds do, he has in his mind, the back of his mind, that they may come inside. So good pitching there by McElroy. And Matt Williams has struck out twice tonight and grounded out the third once. Fastball up and away. That, that may be the one of the key turning points of this game. The very first inning, the Giants had a uh, run home. And they had runners at first and second. Nobody out. And Williams against Smiley. Williams had worn out Smiley over the years. And he ended up striking out into a double play. In an inning where the Giants might have been looking at three, four runs or more, they eventually settled for only two. And Smiley had a problem this year, as Ray Knight had told us, with innings that had gotten out of control and had turned into four, five, six run innings against him. And that's a strike one and two. You know, last year under Davey Johnson, the Reds started slowly. I mean, nothing like this year. But they did start out the year going one and eight. Things were sort of in disarray for a lot of clubs with the short and spring last year after the strike ended and everything. But then they turned it around big time. There's a high drive deep in the left center field. Davis going back. It is gone. A home run for Matt Williams. to be a high slider in 
I think he was trying to get it down and in, probably, but he got it up and in. And Matt Williams deposited in the center field. But there again is an example of what Matt has changed. That ball is into center field rather than pulling the ball. That's why he's hitting for a high average. He's not trying to pull the ball nearly as much as he has in the past. Now right, let's take a look at the pitch. I don't know what that is. <laughs> like a knuckleball. Ball. Yeah, a fork ball maybe. <laughs> maybe it was supposed to be a splitter. I know it wasn't a fastball, but it was supposed to be a splitter. Mark Carrion. One ball, one strike. Matt Williams with his sixth home out of the year. That gives him 24. Runs battered in now. Let's take a look at this pitch from center field. Let's see. Well, it didn't do a lot of anything, but looked like it was supposed to be a splitter down. McElroy is wondering, can the park hold it? No. But give me another ball. 12 to 5 now. And that's a strike on the outside to carry on. The pitcher's spot due up next, and Kim Batiste has come out of the on deck circle for the Giants. Strike three call. So carry on, called out on strikes. Second strike out to McElroy. Two down in the eighth. And now the pinch hitter, Batiste, will come up. To show you the difference in Matt Williams, that is now a 12-game hitting streak for him because he's putting the ball back to the middle of the field more. Well, it looks like it seems... You know what? That was supposed to be a cut fastball, I believe, because it looked like he slid off the side of his finger. But it did not cut very much, and Matt Williams put a charge into it. It didn't cut. It didn't even... It didn't even spin. <laughs> Man. But you could see it come out of the side of his hand, so it was not a splitter. Ken Baptiste from the Philadelphia Philly. Spent last year in the Baltimore Orioles farm system. On to the count. Baptiste, 4 for 24 with a home run this year with the Giants. Last of the eighth inning, the Reds lead 12 to 5. Reds won here 5 to 3 on Friday, 9 to 7 yesterday, and they're leading 12 to 5 tonight. 2 2. McElroy, all of good stuff, but last year he kind of fell apart for the Reds. And he's an important man for that bullpen. He could be a weapon against a guy like Barry Bowles. Well, he strikes out the side, but he also gives up two runs. We go to the ninth inning. Eric Davis will get one more shot at him. 12 to 5, the Reds leading. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Reds 12, Giants 5 as we go to the ninth. From Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Wednesday night, the Wednesday Night Baseball doubleheader. The Colorado Rockies. Larry Walker, Andres Galarraga, Dante Bichette and company. They take on the best pitcher in the league, Greg Maddox and the Atlanta Braves at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. Then at 10.30 Eastern, from the Oakland Coliseum, Albert Bell and the American League champion Cleveland Indians take on Mark McGuire. Yes, he's back. And the Oakland Athletics. Big uh, night of baseball. Uh, stars will be out. Wednesday night's doubleheader. Here's Jose Bautista facing Jeff Branson. As we go to the ninth inning, Bautista, the fourth Giants pitcher of the game. And a foul out of play. Branson hit a sacrifice fly his first time. That made the game 6-3 to three in the seventh inning. Bautista, after a very poor season with the Giants last year, started this season in the minor leagues. And has just been brought back up. And although you saw his earned run average not very good at Phoenix, over four, he kept the ball in the ballpark, which is not that easy in the Pacific Coast League. He gave up only one home run in 39-plus innings down there. So. Well, he gave up a lot of home runs here last year. 24 in little over 100 innings. That was terrible. But he kept the ball in the ballpark down there, and they don't have anybody up here who's been able to keep it in the park. So he's back. Batista. A foul ball. Two balls, two strikes. John, I know you know the answer to this, but I was watching uh, our Wednesday promo about Gary Ma Ma uh, Maddox, Greg Maddox, and he gave up his first grand slam during the season yeah. yesterday. 2,170-something innings. 
without giving up one. Right. And I know there's only one guy that I know of that never gave up a home a grand slam in his career. And Jim Palmer. Jim Palmer. But he told me a story once. He said he had a situation with the bases loaded and Johnny Bench was hitting when they were in triple A. He walked him. <laughs> he, he threw a few high fastballs and Bench didn't swing at them. But he, he got behind in the count. He wasn't about to give him a fastball down the middle. <laughs> two and two the count of Bench. Well, you know, Palmer had some interesting theories about pitching and it was always a good idea to listen if you mean pitching. different theories different theories yeah. than some people but in a spot with the bases loaded as a for instance Jim Rice or some big slugger at the plate if he'd get behind him depending on the game situation he would go ahead and, and risk walking yeah. saying hey at least I can start with a fresh count of the next guy yeah. maybe get ahead of him and one run is certainly better than four one down as Branson is out on strikes, and that will bring up Eric Anthony. Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann, Sports Center, coming up next. They'll tell you about uh, Mark Messier taking charge for the Broadway Blues. Michael Jordan and the Knicks, the Bulls and Knicks in the playoffs, and the Sunday conversation with Barry Bond, and of course, as always, the complete highlights for the day in baseball around the majors. Texas got great pitching today again in the American League in Detroit. The Texas club, when did we see them? Three or four weeks ago. Arlington, they were playing well and they still are. And the Johnny Oates. The Rangers have a record now of 20 and 11, leading the American League West, even though the Angels are getting very hot now. Well, Kenny Hill took the one hitter. And then the next night, Roger Patrick pitched the one hitter. And they say the first time in 70 something years. That's a team that picks back-to-back one hitters. That's not too bad. Not too bad. Especially you usually you'll win if you only give up one hit. <laughs> <laughs> Three and all the count. And that's the walk. So that brings up Eric Davis, who's had a grand slam weekend. Yesterday gets Mark doing This grand slam put the Reds ahead. Then tonight we have Jeff Juden. And this grand slam broke the game open. <laughs> Stan Javier just couldn't believe he didn't catch that ball. <laughs> How could he not know that he hadn't caught it? Joe? He had to look in the glove to make sure. He just knew that he caught that ball. But he came very close to catching it. We saw Ken Griffey Jr. make a catch like that in today's action. Yeah. In fact, if you stay tuned for Sports Center, you'll see it again. I will watch it again. Eric Davis, a high, well, let's see if it's foul. Down the right field line, and it is a foul ball back in amongst the spectators. Ball gets up in the winds here at Candlestick. There's no telling what might happen. But very rarely do they stay fair down the right field line. Now, with the home run tonight for Eric, he now has hit 21 home runs in this ballpark over the years. That's the fourth highest total by any visiting player in the history of Candlestick Park. Dale Murphy and Willie Stargell each hit 25 here. Ron Say hit 24. And then Eric Davis and Tony Perez. Tony Perez, that's right. Davis caught out on strikes. He says he sees the ball well here, not on this particular occasion, but he says he sees the ball much better here than in most places. That's why he's had a lot of success here. Take a look at this fastball that starts out over the plate and runs in to the inside corner. We've seen Eric give up on the pitches inside tonight a couple of times, but that was called strike three. Now Willie Green, one for four with a triple. Reds have had three homers and two triples in this game. 12 to 5 for the Reds. They also had four home runs here yesterday. The Giants have now allowed 44 home runs, and this is their 30th game. One ball and one strike to Willie Green. 12 runs and nine hits for the Reds, five runs and seven hits, and one error for the Giants. Runner at first, two down. One ball and two strikes now to Green. Your staff has given up that many home runs. It's really surprising that the Giants were over 500 before the weekend started. They are 14 and 15 now, but you know when the Reds came in, you know they were above 500. With a loss here tonight, the Giants will be four and a half back in the West. 
The fourth ball struck him out. Bautista strikes out the side. Last chance for the Giants. They trail 12-5. Sunday Night Baseball, Reds 12, Giants 5. We go to the last half of the ninth inning. Now, don't forget, tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, it's the Colorado Avalanche and the Chicago Blackhawks in three of the NHL Western Conference playoffs. The Avalanche won 5-1 to one last night in game two. Patrick Wah stopped 30 shots. Spell that. Wah? Yes. Ow. Uh. <laughs> Wah. That's the Avalanche and the Blackhawks tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern on ASPN. Merci beaucoup. Beaucoup, whatever it is. <laughs> Here is uh, McElroy. I don't speak French, Joe. It's not one of mine. So, uh, English. I hardly speak English. Well, you speak Japanese. I hey, you speak, hey, those yeah, yeah, speak a little Japanese. I know you speak a little Spanish. Well, what else do you know? Wow. <laughs> I was just thinking. Joe yeah. Morgan, my biographer. <laughs> <laughs> There's strike two to Rich Aurelia. He's one for three. Steve Decker has come out on deck for the Giants to bat for Lampkin. And there's another strikeout for McElroy. He's got four strikeouts. Everybody he's retired has been on a strikeout. John Smiley, it's his game to win. He went seven innings, gave up three runs, six hits. And, of course, Smiley is such a key man for this Reds ball club. I mean, he's, he's got to get it going. Because their pitching has not been good. I mean, pure and simple. I mean, there's a lot of injuries and this and that that have hurt the Reds, but a 5.39 ERA as a team coming into this game, that kind of explains that 11 and 17 record very nicely. Yes, it does. But in talking to Don Gullett, you know, the pitching coach, he says the one thing that he knows is that these guys are going to pitch better. And, and that's something to really kind of build on when you have a Shurik and a Smiley who have, they have track records. You know that you're going to get it together. And the Giants are on the opposite end of the spectrum. They do not have any proven winners on their staff. They don't have a stopper. So uh, you don't know how far they can rebound. Although Fernandez, the guy they got from Cuba, has pitched pretty well on occasion. He's 3-1. Yes. Osvaldo Fernandez. Struck out 11 the other night. Right center field. That's into the alleyway. Base hit. It goes for the wall. And Decker has a pinch hit double. Steve Decker, who has hit the ball pretty well this year, came in at 273. And he gets his first double of the year. But well, Decker has always been a pretty good hitter. And we get a look at him. Taking this fastball out over the plate and lines it down in the right center field gap. Now David McCarty. McCarty out of Stanford University, and he was a real high draft choice. The Twins picked him up, but he never blossomed as a twin. Now he's with the Giants. He never hit with any power in Minnesota, but with the Giants this year, he's got two home runs in only 14 at-bats already. He's three for 14, two homers and five driven in. He walked in the seventh inning and his only trip to the plate tonight. David McCarty. And the count one ball, one strike. One of those guys, Joe. Looked like a, a sure big league prospect. And he got to the big leagues and he found out just what kind of a jump that really was from college to the major. And it is a big jump. And you have to remember that they're swinging aluminum back in college and you do not have to protect your kitchen with a aluminum bat they can pitch you inside you can still get around in the big leagues they can jam you and make you conscious of the inside pitch and then go away so it's a little different hitting in the big league than it is in college simply because of the, the bat and the control of most pitchers yeah. and and they throw the curveball yes that's right pretty well yeah, yeah. two and two now to mccarty the big league curveball. Although in the American League, especially Joe, these days, teams are having some problems finding big league type pitchers. I mean, the American League has a, a, a league-wide earned run average above five yeah, right now, which is amazing for the whole league. You know. David Johnson, the former manager of the Reds, has said he's had to rethink some of his managerial theories about how to handle pitchers. Because of how many runs are being scored over there. 
Here's ball four to McCarty. Second walk allowed by McElroy. Two men on. One man on, and Stan Javier coming up. I mean, trying to replace Davy Johnson with the Reds. I don't think there's any doubt, John. A, a, a manager in today's game has to think a lot differently than they did, you know, in years past because the pitching and the runs that are being scored now, you may have to leave your starter in a little longer, you know, let him give up a few more runs. Well, I'll tell you, pass. as Don Gullick goes to the mound here, the Reds have some activity in their bullpen. Davy Johnson said that is that Johnny Ruffin warms up in the bullpen. Davy Johnson said that in the National League, he usually felt like if you could hold the other team four runs or under, right, that you could win. Yes. So you didn't want him to get more than four runs. Once your starter got up around three or four runs, he had thought, well, I can't afford to let any more runs score. I've got to go get it. But he's found in the American League that you can't really look at it quite that way. You've got to get some innings and maybe let him give up a little bit more than that. His Orioles went through a stretch, Joe. They were three and eleven after their great start. Right. Three and eleven, and they averaged six point six runs a game in that stretch. So they were scoring, but and he and he, the went, other he went through his bullpen pretty quickly. A lot of nights. That's a ball. One ball and one strike. Well, you know, you go back into baseball history. I mean, you go back into the 1930s. And the New York Yankees had whole seasons where they averaged almost seven runs a game. So we know that there have been times in history when then huge numbers of runs were scored in the days of Ruth and Gary and Rogers Hornsby. And Who are those guys? I don't <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's the new theory, right? The, Who are those guys? If they're dead, do not talk about them. <laughs> but, but this is just between you and okay, me. Okay, just between us. Okay. Yeah. Two and one to Javier. Pops it up. Howard in left field. And that's the second out. Two men down. Two down, two on in the last of the ninth inning. Sports Center coming up next. Steve Scarsoni is the last giant hitter. Unless he can get on base, and then Barry Bonds would get a shot out. The Reds won five to three Friday, nine to seven yesterday, and are leading. 12 to 5 tonight. They've had eight home runs here this week. Just, I mean, just this weekend. Scarsoni drives one foul. Seems kind like of fun, though, to Dusty Baker. Oh, man. It's kind of funny if Barry Bonds did get up in this inning with a few men out there. Scarsoni walked to start the eighth inning against McElroy. That's a ball. One ball and one strike. Next Sunday night, We'll be at Anaheim Stadium. The California Angels, they won six in a row. And the Cleveland Indians, who had the best record in the majors right now, 20 and 9. Although, you know, really it's not surprising, I guess, that Cleveland would have the best record. Well, they got off to a slow start. They were 2 and 5 at one point. That gets through, and Bonds will back. Coming around third is Decker. He'll score. Going to third is McCarty. And Barry Bonds will. Give it a shot here against his nemesis, Chuck McElroy. 12 to 6 for the Reds now. This will be interesting. Uh, McElroy went after Bonds because he has a lot of confidence in getting him out, and he made excellent pitches on him. In fact, he struck out the side his first inning here, but he gave up the home run to Matt Williams, and he probably doesn't feel as comfortable pitching to Matt Williams. So we'll see if he changes and just tries to overpower Bonds again. Bonds is one for 23 against in lifetime. Fastball. Too low. Chris McElroy, I'm sure, has rarely faced Bonds more than one time in a game. Well, I'm sure that's true. Popped it up. Or is it a pop? It goes down there. <laughs> a 350 foot pop up and the ball game is over the reds have won it and have swept the series from the giants and the reds are just three games out in the central the giants four and a half out in the west well i think as i said before i think the reds do have something to build on sure pete shurik and john smiley to get their pitching staff in shape the giants on the other hand i think they're still searching for someone indeed 
be the pitcher who can keep the ball in the ballpark. Next Sunday, we'll greet you from Anaheim. Albert Bell and the American League champion Cleveland Indians take on Jim Edmonds, the California Angels, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. But as for tonight, Eric Davis, the grand salami. The Reds win it 12 to 6. Sports Center coming up next. Don't miss it. Now, this is John Miller for Joe Morgan from San Francisco. Good night, everyone. We'll see you next week.